to be completely misshapen and doesn't want to sit on my ear properly. But a good afternoon. Wild Spice has changed the shape of the mic and it's gone flying. He still hasn't thought of a good name for me, by the way, in terms of all of the Spice Girls' names. I'm not quite sure whether I feel flattered or insulted in that particular aspect. But welcome on our sunset safari. I'm sure you were all missing your sunrise safari, us included. But I hope that you all enjoyed the experimentation of yesterday evening with the thermal imaging drone, as well as testing out of that new night vision camera. And don't forget, we are coming to you live from Juma and Arethusa Game Reserves in the Sabi Sands in the Great Akruga National Park of South Africa. And you can also send through your questions or your comments on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. We always love to hear from you, and if we have any new viewers watching us for the first time this afternoon, let us know if you are new, and where you come from and where you're watching from. We have viewers all around the world, from Tokyo right across through Europe and into America and Canada, and right down into South America. My name is Jamie. I have Dave on camera with me. Sorry, Dave, I almost forgot to introduce us both. And we're looking forward to conducting your sunset safari this afternoon. Just got an update from Ephraim that there are tracks for Tingana and Tandi wandering around on Central between Gauri Cutline and Central uh, and Tignana Road Junction. So I think that's my plan. I mean, trying to toss up whether I want to go look for the Inkuruma ladies, whether I want to go see if I can find their tracks. If I want to go look for those leopards, I've also had a report that there's a massive herd of buffalo moving up from the southeastern corner. Our regular viewers will know that there are lots of lions to the southeast of our boundary between the Birmingham boys and the Sticks ladies are fairly regularly in that area. And as our regular viewers know, with herds of buffalo, very often we get lions following behind. And on a cool day like today, cats could be out and about much earlier than they would usually be. I say it's cool. It is 27 degrees, which equates to, sorry, give me one moment, I think it's around 83 degrees Fahrenheit, which to us is a blessed relief from the boiling hot sunlight. And Scott's just calling me on the Game Drive channel. Let me see what he's up to. Standing by. That's perfect spot. I've just come along past Gallagher Pan. Ephraim says there's the forms of all those anywhere around central between Gary Cutline and Dalva Road. Scott and myself are just discussing our plans for this afternoon. Thanks, Woody. So Scott and Brian will be out on Rusty to help us look. And there we go. We can divide our labor. Scott's going to go check the boundary for the Inkahumas and see if they've crossed somewhere around there. And we'll go look for those mating leopards. We saw them yesterday. It didn't look as though they were coming to the end of their mating cycle. Hello, little ones. how big our baby and parlor have got. And just one more update. I know that you guys missed our sunrise safari this morning. We just took a chance to sleep in. I must tell you that we had long discussions after last night's night drive which eventually led to some of us going to bed at 2 o'clock in the morning, which I think is probably the latest I have stayed up in at least a year, if not longer. My standard bedtime is about 9 at night. But we will be repeating the same process again this evening. And Steve, you were wondering, Steve was watching in London. Steve was wondering, well, when will the Sunrise Safaris be back? Steve, we're going to take another morning off tomorrow morning, just because we simply cannot get the 
we, we simply wouldn't be able to bring you a really pleasant sunrise safari if we were going to be completely exhausted. Getting up at half past four when your bedtime is after nine o'clock is a bit tricky. So tomorrow morning there will be no sunset safari. The morning after that we will be back to our normal schedule. And never fear, we're not planning on removing the sunset safaris from your lives. The morning is the best time for us to be in the bush. Hello, little ones. There we go. I asked for any of your new viewers to let us know. Rachel, hop over. Welcome to our sunset safari. Rachel, you're saying this is so cool. Well, Rachel, I agree with you. I think the live safari is the best possible way for everybody across the globe to get to experience wildlife. We can't script it. We don't know what we can expect. We never know where our drive is going to go. We've had wild dogs suddenly appear in mid-sentence. We've had leopards walk across the road in front of us and we've come round the corner into a herd of glorious feeding elephants. And Rachel, we are interactive as well. So not only can you watch African wildlife live from the comfort of your living room, bedroom, study, or wherever you happen to be watching us, but you can also send through your questions about anything you'd like to know. And we are absolutely open to anything from the most basic to the most advanced questions that you can think up to try and catch us out, or at least make us think. While we head off in the direction of those leopard tracks and see if we can get any audio of the mating, I believe a Scott would like to say good afternoon to you all. Hello everyone. For those of you who haven't met me before, like Rachel, my name is Scott and I'm teamed up with Brian. And he has a famous thumb that you may see poking into the bottom of the screen. Now, Rachel, before I continue, I must warn you that Jamie Patterson has got this ability, it's quite remarkable, of talking about things and within minutes them coming true. So don't be startled that if you get hurried across back onto her vehicle to a pack of wild dogs that she locates. She's had on a number of occasions the most uncanny of scenarios unfold. What would happen if wild dogs arrived at the hyena den and within 30 seconds there's a pack of wild dogs running around the hyena den? So let's hope that that luck comes through this afternoon. Failing that, there is always going to be some interesting stuff going on out here. Our plans are to check the northern boundary for any sign of five lioness, parts of the Inkahuma pride. And they were just on the fringe of our northern boundary last night. And Nikki and I came out midday to check if there were any tracks coming south. But the little portion that we checked didn't indicate that that was the case. Now, we may have missed the tracks. The ground in some areas is very uh, hard and therefore it can be difficult to be certain if an animal's even been there, big or small. Um, anyway, I'm going to continue checking that northern boundary, not only solely for the lions, but for any interesting animals that may have come across, cheetah, leopard, elephants, buffalo. I'm told that there was a large herd of buffalo heading towards uh, Juma this morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we weren't out. We had a rare morning off due to being out late last night playing with some night vision equipment. Just seen a very interesting bird, but oof, it's quite far. Sheesh, Brian, that didn't take you long. And I don't know what Brian had for lunch, but he's certainly very focused. That is a little sparrowhawk, and I'm fairly sure. Um, from what little view I've had so far, that is my diagnosis because it is far away it's hard to be certain it looks like it's got yellow legs to me and definitely a yellow ring around the eye and this could well be a new bird for your bird list what may work is taking some screenshots and then being able to maybe crop into them brian is at full zoom of course he wouldn't be teasing you guys and stop <laughs> zooming in there just to make it more challenging um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out my bird book now, and you guys just keep looking at as many of the little features that you can. But again, those kind of 
yellowy orange legs plus that yellow ring around its eye are characteristic. You may also see, see two, yes, those two little spots on its tail. There's a stick in the way, but, oh, oh no. Oh, there's a very big stick in the way. But you may have seen two little white spots on its tail. I think we can now come down to the book. And that bird is absolutely tiny. Um, it's hard for you to be certain how big animals are over the screen, but according to the book here, uh, the height of that bird is 25 centimeters, so not large at all. That's from the tip of the tail to the top of its head. And another bird that you could relate to is a laughing dove. That's of a very, very similar size. So that's a little sparrowhawk. I'm not sure when last I managed to show you one of those, so possibly a new, new bird for a lot of your bird lists, which are coming along well. Again, for the new viewers, it would be worth considering starting a bird list. Even if you're not an ornithologist, you may just not have discovered that you are. And a bird list is a great way of getting involved in the bird watching scene. And on safari, it's not just about lion and leopard, even though we do love spending time with them, and we do spend a lot of time trying to track them down. A lot of safari time is filled up with the other animals, and not only animals, a lot of the plants and vegetation also make, and scenery make for the whole safari experience. Well done there, Brian. I looked back to, <laughs> to, to see if I thought he, he knew where it was, and it was already popped up full on the monitor. <laughs> Just approaching our northern boundary now, and to keep you guys updated, we checked from to the west to the east, and now we're going to continue east. Hello to Tony in London, and you're inquiring about the weather last night. You were watching the night drive, and for those who weren't, there was an incredibly powerful wind that came gusting through that prevented the final uh, drone sequence from happening, um, which was a bit of a disappointment. But what can you do if the weather changes? You just have to deal with it. And again, that is the beauty of being on a live safari. You just roll with all the various things that can go wrong and can go right. Um, Tony's interested if it that rain brought any, or wind rather, brought any rain. And nothing serious, Tony. There was a tiny downpour. I think we got two mils in total. We've also had a small amount of rain through the course of today. At about 11 a.m., we had a very, very slight shower. But, I mean, I can jump out now to give you, oh, sorry about the squeaky brakes. Can jump out now. I mean, if I just pick up the soil, you can see it's, it doesn't look like it's, oh, no, I'm even just making Brian's camera lens dirty. So it's very dry and dusty still. Not much moisture at all. And who knows when we are finally going to get some rain. We are in a big dry. Oh, you cannot believe what's happened. No ways. It's not easy to see, but you'll see a big turkey-like bird. Hopefully, I, I am going to move, but it's a ground hornbill. And it was so close to us. Thankfully, I didn't chase it off. Yeah, it looks like it's coming into shots. Awesome, here we go. This is a highly endangered bird that we don't get to see very often. It could well be with the more f a few more flock members. It's not common to see them alone. Let's see if we can't creep forward a little bit. It's getting just a bit too far. Well, great news from Diane, who got her 134th bird with that Gabar Gosselk. Now we're getting some great views. Look at its interesting feet. 
And apologies, not goshawk, sparrowhawk. Now, one thing I've always wanted to see is the southern ground hornbill that we're viewing now hunting. They can be quite ferocious hunters. As you can see, they hunt by walking around, and then they'll overpower snakes, lizards, rodents, frogs, just about anything, really, that they can overpower. And interestingly, if it does have some other flock members here, they sometimes, the males will sometimes carry brightly colored kills to the ladies. It's kind of jewels or crescents. Oh, I think it's found something to nibble on there. But we just need to be very, very delicate. They can be quite nervous. And we don't want to put any unnecessary pressure on it. It looks to me like this could be a male. The female have got blue patches that you can see within that kind of red throat patching. But it's not in incredibly easy to see unless you get a really good look. Let's see if we can't creep forward a little bit more. Now, all this time that we've been moving, obviously, if the lion tracks did cross here, I'm not going to have seen them. So let's hope that's not the case. Keeping one eye on us and one eye on some potential food sources. This, I think, is one of the best ground hornbill sightings I've had with you. Definitely the closest I've been. Prehistoric looking birds. And I mean, it's large. It's, it's certainly turkey size. And with that big beak, like I said, they can take on formidable prey such as snakes. The sad thing about these birds and the reason why they are endangered is because of their very, very slow breeding programs. And now you can see clearly there's no blue patches on that red throat patch. So Paul Rizzo, I think we can confirm that this is a male. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. So they've got very slow nesting, as I was saying, or very uh, slow reproduction. They only raise one chick at a time, and possibly only once every two or three years will they raise a new chick. Start up again. Thanks, thanks. I think that is probably some total of the good views we are going to get of this bird. Thanks, <laughs> Well, I mentioned that the the Hornbill's got quite funny feet or interesting feet, and I love Donna. Uh, your, your explanation is that it looks like it was walking on high heels, and that's spot on. That's exactly what it was like. That back toe is a bit kind of pronounced, you could say. So thank you for sharing that. Very good analogy for the feet of a ground hornbill. The stiletto bird. Hello to Joker or Jauke in the Netherlands. I'm not too sure how to pronounce your name, so let us know if we are pronouncing it wrong. Um, you would like to know where exactly in South Africa we are. Well, um, I wish I had a pen with me, but I don't. Um, so I don't have the whole map of South Africa. But basically, if you were to look at a map of South Africa, we are nestled right in the northeastern corner. So from here, basically, northwards, is Zimbabwe, and everything on the right of the page here is Mozambique. So this whole stretch of the Kruger National Park, 300 kilometers long, is on the Mozambican boundary. Further north thereof is Zimbabwe. So now at least you know where in South Africa we are. And then within the Kruger National Park, we are nestled in this little corner here. 
So there are no fences between the Sabi Sands Reserve, which we are a part of, 60,000 hectares, uh, which is open to the 3 million odd hectares, which is the Kruger National Park. And like I say, we're in this tiny little corner here. So about a quarter of the way up the Kruger. It's a long, thin reserve, but it is ginormous. Bigger than Wales, Israel, uh, several countries. So I hope, Yalka, that that helps give you an idea of where exactly we are in the country. It's an incredible wilderness area, and we are so, so lucky to be here. Carol, you would like to see the tracks of this ground hornbill, so let's just back it on up quickly and see if we can't find where it crossed. Carol, you are watching in Atlanta. I hope everything in Atlanta is going well. It's not going to be easy to find these tracks, Carol. You've, you've put me to the test here. Firstly, because I don't have a clue where exactly it did cross initially. Also, the ground is very hard. And on top of the hard road, it's also overcast, which makes it very difficult to see tracks because the sunlight is not helping by casting shadows onto it. Further down? Yeah, it was definitely further down. OK, well, I didn't see it on the first round there. Um, Yalka, you've already sent through another question, and you would like to know if these birds can fly big distances. And yes, they can fly fa fairly uh, far. Oh, well done. Thank you, Nikki. It crossed just on this little, those little droppings on the road over there. At least somebody's paying attention. <laughs> um, so yes, Yalka, I mean, a, a ground horn bull could fly for kilometers if it, if it needed to, but they typically uh, spend a lot of time on the ground doing all of their feeding. One bird that we do get here in the Kruger National Park, sadly not too often here in the Sabi Sands, but you do occasionally get the odd stray ostrich, but that is the one bird that cannot fly. We've also got a relative of the heaviest flying bird, the bustards. Um, which, which occur here, again, not very commonly seen, but we do also see those. I think the heaviest flying bird is the royal bustard. Ours, the quarry bustard, is slightly smaller than that. So now I've parked right on top of this dung, but I can't, for the life of me, see any tracks where it crossed. It crossed somewhere just behind the dung, but the ground is just too hard, Carol. Uh, oh, hang on. Here we go. I found the track, but shoo, it's going to be tricky to see. I'm using my flashlight to try and Can't see it. Is the car in the way? Yeah. Okay, well, then we can fix that. We can move the car. At least we can see the track. I've just left my. I'm just going to swivel the car around to give Brian an angle. There we go. That should work. <laughs> OK. So, I'm not sure if you can see the one, two, three front toes. Can you? Yeah. Yay! And then here is where the stiletto punctured into the ground. So, if my fingers were to replicate the track, that's pretty much spot on. Dunk! Awesome stuff. So there's at least one track. The rest thereafter, even with my flashlight, the ground's simply too hard. So we got lucky, and at least we can see this one individual stilettoed southern ground hornbill birds track. Yeah, thank you, Carol, for initiating that operation. And thank you, Nikki, for reminding me where exactly it crossed. And that is the joy of being on the biggest safari vehicle on the planet, is that there are often lots of people to help you. 
the funniest, or not the funniest, but one of the aw most awesome things is if you forget something somewhere, like on a bushwalk, James has forgotten his binoculars quite a few times. And a few minutes later, you get the message coming through saying, James, you left your binoculars on that termite mound. Go back. Um, cool. So we're going to continue along the northern boundary, hopefully find some tracks of anything exciting. Failing that, we might not even need to fi find the tracks. We could just get lucky and find the animals. That'll be even better. But while we continue along, we are going to be sending you back to Jamie for an update on how she's getting along. Uh, we've found you one of the most beautiful, but also one of the shyest antelope species that we get out here. In this case, it's about a, a year old to a year and a half year old kudu bull. His horns are only just starting to show through. And the old adage that if you start looking for one kudu, you're going to see more, it has proved to be absolutely true in this particular case. We've stumbled upon a whole herd of these graceful animals. Don't stop there, girl. There you go. Out you come. Those beautiful round oh, tail up and a bit of a warning signal. Something spooked her. Don't really think it was us. Here comes that male that I was talking about. And you can see he's starting to get that thick neck of a mature kudu uh, ball. The fur starting to grow along the bottom. Only the males have horns, of course, as with all of the spiral horned antelope family. You can just see the grace and power with which they move, even at a steady walking pace like this, with their tan stockings. Definitely, to me, one of my favorite antelope to sit and watch. You go forward. Don't go, boy. Let's try and find another position to watch them from. away. Now as a browser species, the kudu will have a little bit more resilience to face this drought. I mentioned earlier that it's cooled down nicely and the fact that we really are appreciating the dip in temperature after our incredibly boiling hot day yesterday and temperatures topping out at somewhere around 44, 45 degrees Fahrenheit, so well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And luckily, the clouds rolled in at about 12 o'clock last night, bringing with them about two smatterings of rain. We think we probably had about less than 0.2 mils of moisture coming from the sky. Donna was trying to say, how long has it been? How many days has it been since we had a good rain? And how long can we carry on before it becomes a major problem? Donna, I'm trying to think, honestly, I'm, I'm trying to look back and work out when we last had a good rain. I think there was quite a solid rain at the beginning of January. Where are we now? We're almost at the end of February. I would say, Donna, it, it was at least 30 days. It was probably more. We had very brief downpours. And even, you know, to say we've had good rain, we've had a couple of shower bursts that have maybe given us at the most 10 mils, but nothing to the extent that we really need to properly break the drought and actually start. In fact, it is a bit too late for us to really start filling up those dams to then last us through the dry season, through winter. This should be our rainy season, particularly in February. And so Nancy Lou, you wanted to know when is the rainy season. The rainy season in theory is now. And my experience in the last few years in the low felt has been that February has the most rainfall that I experience. You get, it starts at around November, carries through December, but it's in February, beginning of March, that we've had those two weeks of solid downpour. So Nancy Lou, it is our 
it is our wet season in theory now, but despite being overcast, we had a few overcast days, but nothing that's brought any kind of moisture to us. The dry season will start around April. Donna, in terms of how much longer we can last without it becoming a major problem, that's a difficult one for me to answer, and I'll tell you why. It's already become a major, not necessarily a major problem, but it is definitely going to have a major impact. It's already at that point where I don't think we're going to be able to in any way recover from it. Sorry, I'm on Hyena Road. I think it might be the bumpiest road we have on Juba. Donna, already the dams are empty. We're coming up to our dry season starting in April, or beginning of April. And there's absolutely no water going into that season. The trees have had no water. Already one of our boreholes that we pump water up from underground has partially at least dried up, which is a, a very interesting prospect. There are other boreholes that are busy bringing water down. Beautiful metal tree. You can see the sky's heavy and look like they're laden with moisture, but just no, no real sign of any relief. And for the animals of Kruger, we have spoken about this before. It won't be a complete disaster because they've got four, four million hectares in which to move about in and to get access to resources. So the larger your area, the more resilient it's going to be. And in the end, by the end of the drought, those weaker animals will have died, but will have strengthened the genetic lines of the survivors. Maurice? I honestly don't know if there's any more rain that's going to be forecast. If it were going to do a proper rainfall, I would have expected it last night and this morning. So that heat that we got yesterday is fairly, fairly typical, although I must say I haven't really experienced anything like it in the low fell for a long time. But what, it, what happens is when a cold front or a rain front pushes forward, it usually pushes the hot air in front of it, which is why we had that boiling hot day yesterday. And then what usually happens is you get a break with a huge thunderstorm and massive downpour. And if you're lucky after that, once that, that cold front or rain front has shifted over you, you then get that fairly constant drizzle or downpour. I was hoping we were going to wake up to that this morning. It didn't happen. We had two drops of rain spitting on us at some stage. But other than that, nothing at all has come through. And that, that's where not typically, in terms of the weather patterns and the, the way that the fronts work, that would have been where I expected to have the rain. Now, for the next few days, it just remains to be seen. Maybe the rain will just keep pushing rather than getting caught up over the mountains. I hope so, but I'm not entirely convinced. I'll just give you an update on where I am and why I'm trundling down one of the bumpiest roads in Juma. The leopard tracks were around Central Road. Last night when we started our after dark safari, our nighttime safari, we need a really nice catchy name for that, we saw Karula going down towards the dam to have a drink and she was accompanied or she met up with Tingana. I didn't see Tandi, I don't know where Tandi was. I don't know, she must have been somewhere in the vicinity because Tingana was showing or displaying a little bit of aggression towards he was growling a little bit at her, and that's fairly typical of a male defending another female that he's currently mating with. So I think that's the, the easiest explanation for the amount of aggression that Tingana showed. It wasn't serious, he wasn't of any kind of threat to her, he was just sort of pulling up his upper lip and giving her a very low, deep bass growl. We stayed with Karula. She moved off into the area between Mbubu Road and Gari Cutline. And Tigana, I think, has moved off further to the east. So essentially what I'm doing is grid-like patterns around the roads where they were seen. As I said earlier, first of all, leopards are very unpredictable in terms of their times of movement. We've seen Tingana moving around on a 40-degree day in the middle of the day in the sunlight, despite the fact that all of the textbooks that he obviously didn't read, he didn't do his homework, all of the textbooks say he should be sleeping in the shade. He chose to ignore that particular aspect and no wondering. So on a day like today, I think there's a very strong possibility that those leopards are going to be wandering around and covering quite a bit of distance. Which is why I'm checking very thoroughly around here. back to the storm 
that we had last night. We were watching with that high ISO camera as the lightning lit up the horizon. It never really quite reached us, but we have had a couple of loud, what I would term political thunderstorms, which are essentially all noise and no rain. Lots of noise and action and light show, but not much actual good coming of it. But Peter was wondering, does a fire ever get started by lightning on the reserve? Peter, I've been in a situation where, particularly at the end of our dry season in October, where we start to get the first hints of those thunderstorms, but not necessarily the moisture that should accompany them. And they strike, they catch onto a dead tree, and that starts a fire. That happened to me, oh goodness. I need to just think now about which year it was. It was either two or three years ago, where lightning caught on a dead tree and it's, it sparked a wildfire that moved. It was a windy day like today, and it was probably one of the most terrifying wildfires I've ever been involved in trying to fight in my life. It always happens at night because generally our thunderstorms tend to roll in in the late afternoon. And we had fire on both sides of the road, trying to drive through it with flames that were easily 30, 40 feet high. That being said now, Peter, you see the little, oh, little Simbuki, don't run away. Stop there. There we go. Thank you, boy. Good boy. He went from one of the largest antelope, the kudu, to one of our smallest little species. Also, just as keen on being cryptically camouflaged and hidden away in thick vegetation. But he also gives me a chance, as we sit and watch him, to just listen for any sound of those mating leopards. Peter, to finish off with your question about the lightning, at this point it is highly, highly unlikely that any wildfires are going. They might be started, but the chances of them spreading is absolutely minimal. And while you look at that Steenbok, maybe not the best example, but you can see how little ground cover there is. So it might catch on some of the dead pieces of wood that are around him. But beyond that, it's not going to do or spread in any major way. I know that James has demonstrated once or twice how impossible it would be to get a fire started or how difficult it would be to get a fire started out here. Oh, hello. I didn't even see you, girl. Here we go, male and female Steenbok, living together in their mated pairs. Male having a quick groom. I didn't even notice that female hiding there. Little female on the left without horns and the little male on the right with horns. And they generally move in their tiny little 300 meter square territory that they will maintain together. Monogamous which means that they mate for life. They'll spend their entire lives, barring the death of one or both, together. Which is quite unusual in the antelope species, but quite common in the little, the dwarf antelope species. Animals like the dakers and the steenboks like to live together in mated pairs. And they'll forage around on their own, coming together during the day, as these two have, and then moving off again, once again on their own. Where did that female go? She looked very round, there she is. She looked very round bellied to me. Well, I might, no, I think I was imagining it. She is bigger than him, which is interesting. She is stockier than him. Here we go. Awesome. Nice little post Valentine's Day treat of the monogamous antelope species. I'm going to carry on though, see if I can't figure out where these leopards have gone and what they were up to last night. Speaking of unique little antelope, there is one particular impala that I suspect might be one of the most famous impala in the entire world. And Joyce, who's watching in New Hampshire, was wondering, and Joyce, I wonder if you know Darlene, who I think also watches in New Hampshire. Um, Joyce, 
you were wondering where is, is it, if anyone has seen the one-horned, one-eyed impala who has been nicknamed Nelson. Joyce, he was seen on Valentine's Day. That was the last time anybody saw him. Brent had him on the Sunrise Safari. And he was looking in good condition, good health. That eye has healed up nicely. We, uh, we know that he'll never have any vision in it. But he has certainly become something of a famous and rather characterful impala. Now, he started off as just a one-horned impala. And during the false rut, which happens when the ewes give birth, the males get a bit confused and they start fighting each other for mating opportunities that aren't going to happen. And during that false rut period, Nelson obviously with his one horn that had been broken off some time in the past, couldn't protect the side of his face. And I suspect that was what happened to his eye. He took a horn to the eye. And it was, when we first spotted him, when we first saw him, it was a really grievous looking injury. It looked terrible, it was very painful. But it's healed up nicely, it no longer weeps as much. Now, Scott is also sitting on Bubbles for Cutline and apparently has been spying on us while we drive along on our merry way. Oh, I can see Scott all the way at the back there. I believe you're watching us trundle our way towards the eastern boundary. One of the wonderful things about Bucklesford Cutline is a spectacular road to drive on, especially when you've got beautiful sunrises or sunsets. <coughs> Excuse me, because you can see as far as you can in a straight line. Joyce, I always check for Nelson. I check every single bachelor herd of Impala in his area. <coughs> oh, sorry, I think I breathed in <coughs> some dust. Very dusty. Yes, Joyce, I'm always on the lookout. I, I find it impossible now to drive past a bachelor herd of impala without checking. Just gonna check this jackalberry tree very carefully. It's one of those funny things. I've spoken about this before. When you have a sighting of an animal in a position like this, no matter how slim you think the chances are, you always go underneath and check carefully. There's a bit of dacre left in the tree from Karula's last kill. It's in the sort of main fork of the tree, just behind this overhanging branch. There we go. Up a little bit there. There's a hoof and a little bit of the skull. <coughs> I think it might have been a bug that I just inhaled. Please excuse me. Yes, so the Dacre kill that Karula abandoned, not this time around, but the last time that Tundi and Tingana were mating on her territorial area. She was very unimpressed as she has been this time around. Which is why I always stop and check this jackalberry tree. I know that she likes this area. But she never finished off her dacre kill. This goes to show how important such a territorial infringement will seem to a leopard of that, in that kind of situation. So much so that she would abandon her kill and leave it for, essentially for the ants to finish off. It's so well tucked in this jackalberry, jackalberry tree that the hyenas would never be able to reach it, which is why it still remains. You can see the remains of the jaw and then the leg bent up and around and the tufts of fur. And it will have to be the insects that do the job of clearing up this particular carcass. Leopard sightings and Tim Govins, you're 
wondering, do we have a particularly high leopard density within the Savi Sands? Um, or is it because the guides seem to know the leopards better than most, or at least know their individual leopards and the movements of the individual leopards? Because we seem to be seeing them so often. And yes, they are very reclusive animals, and in certain areas, we, we definitely see them far more frequently in the Sabi Sands than you might as you drive through Kruger. There's a couple of reasons for it, Tim. First of all, yes, Sabi Sands does have quite a nice high density of leopards, less so in the area that we're in, in the northern Sabi Sands. It's much, they're much more highly concentrated. Their territories are smaller and more closely densely packed together around the riverine areas or the river areas towards the south. That being said, there's still plenty of them around, and yes, it's a combination of the fact that we know the leopards, we know the individual leopards, we're familiar, if not with their movements, their everyday movements and paths and patterns, but also just the areas in which they consider to be their core part of their home territory. There's one other reason that we see them quite so frequent. Oh, also, of course, compared, for example, to a self-drive through Kruger, we're allowed to off-road and we can track. We can get off and we can go tracking and we can go walking and look for them. And I think it's a persistence and determination that does make a little bit of a difference. And then the Sabi Sands leopards have been notoriously well-managed for years and years and years since the start of the Sabi Sands as a reserve area. They've been gradually habituated to the presence of vehicles and the presence of people to the point now that they go about their daily business without any concern for what the vehicles are doing, provided they are treated with absolute respect and clarity. And speaking about leopards, interestingly enough, I believe that Scott might have found the leopard tracks that I've been looking for, so let's pop over back towards him and find out what he's found. Hello everyone and welcome back. I've jumped out the vehicle because we found some leopard tracks. Looks like a big male leopard has walked along this road. Not easy to see the tracks where I am here, but when we get to this bush, it becomes a little bit easier. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move this bush out the way, although it's an important part of what happened here. And now that I've moved it out the way, you may be able to see, here's one quite easy to see paw print over here. One, two, three, four toes. And here's some more over here. One, two, three, four. And then it continues on. Another set over here. So I've been following its tracks moving down the road in the direction you can see Brian's showing you. But what's interesting is that this track over here is pointing directly towards me. So there's been a major change of course and plans for this leopard, and that's why it's interesting, and the fact that this bush is involved in the story is what I'm about to show you. So, I'm about to go into leopard mode here. What would have happened is it would have been walking along the road like this, and then seen this bush and thought, this is the perfect place for me to leave a message and leave a territorial scent mark. So it would have turned around into the bush, had a pee, psh, and then possibly even rubbed itself up into the bush on its back legs, and then continued along. So that's what leopards look like when they scent mark, kind of. <laughs> um, I probably did a terrible impersonation. Uh, but interesting to know that this big male leopard was scent marking here. Who it could be, I'm not too sure. We haven't seen Tingana this far north. That's not to say he doesn't come here. So possibly it's a male from the Buffalswood property, so to the, the left of the road. We don't drive, so we don't know too much about what's going on there, and this could be the kind of territorial buffer between Tangana, the big male that we see, and another big male that will occur to the north of us. So interesting stuff, can't be certain. And I know you guys were discussing leopard densities with Jamie and how lucky we are with the amounts of leopard that we do see here. I mean, yesterday is testament to that. We saw three different adult leopards yesterday evening, Tingana and Tandi being two of them, and we saw them mating a lot of the time as well. So that was incredible. And then what was really interesting, and Nora, I know it's your birthday, so happy birthday, Nora. You were hoping for an update on Karula, and this is an important update because I saw something really interesting happen last night at the Juma Waterhole, and I'm not sure if you were tuned in late last night, 
when Jamie was there, but basically Tingana was drinking, 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 and then eventually Karula came to drink near him, and she was hissing at him quite aggressively, and it's an interaction that I've never really seen before out of all my years of leopard viewing. I've never seen a leopardess uh, kind of react to a male in that nature, so it was, it was, it was fascinating, especially because there was no meat around, and maybe she was saying, you know what, Tingana, I'm not impressed with you bringing my daughter, Tandy, so deep into my territory. What were you thinking? Possibly that was it, just saying, like, you know, come on, buddy, give me a break. This is the last thing I need having my daughter stomping on my territory. So, Nora, that's the last update we have on her. She was seen late last night hissing at Tangana. Thereafter, I'm not too sure what happened, where they headed. Aha, uh -huh, now. Rain, who's just 15 years old, would like to know my thoughts on what would happen if Tandi and her mother Karula were to get into a fight. Would Tingana get involved? I don't think so, Rain. Um, but then again, I must say that I've never seen leopards fighting. Not even two boys, not even two girls, let alone two girls with a male in the mix. Um, so, sure. Um, I just don't see why Tingana would want to uh, get involved. Uh, there's nothing really in it for him. So that's why I don't think um, he would have done anything. Um, he would have just left the ladies to, to, to fight amongst themselves. And I guess it's kind of similar to lions um, and, and, and even leopards with regards to territories, Rain. Uh, male leopards will compete with male leopards for territory um, and female leopards will compete with female leopards from territory and what you'll f for territory. And what you'll find is one male, depending on how dominant he is, may have three or four or five females within his turf. And like I said, he'll let them sort out their problems. He's not interested. He's got his own problems to sort out and that's fighting with the other males and organizing his, his problems in sorting out, out land and territory uh, for himself. And, and this, it's the same for lions. Uh, prides of lioness will compete with one another for territory. The males, you know, they won't mind uh, if, if the ladies are having their altercations. Uh, as long as there's no other males giving them a hard time, they'll be happy. So I hope that answers your question, Rain. Um, the only way to be certain is if we actually were to see the event unfold. But I'm guessing that Tingana would not get involved. This leopard track, is still heading down the road here, and we should be able to see some on the right here, Brian. Just going to chat with Tex in quickly. Go ahead, Tex. Tex is one of the guides from Juma, so if you ever come out on holiday here, he might be driving you around there. You would have seen a few of the pug marks. A Texan, go ahead. And this yeah, one has been from some time after the rain. They're close, just at the southern side of Sydney's dam, um, to the south. I'm gonna check around the um, dumping, old dumping area there towards the Vietnam main exit. Copy, well done, Tex. I'll uh, come back into that area and give you a hand. Oh, I can cook it. Yeah, no, I just crossed there from that uh, center page north. Uh, um, Some good news, the lions have come back. Please can you drop a branch there? Because I've checked and I want to see how I didn't see them. <laughs> yeah, when you get into that turn of the door to Sydney's down, just go a little bit more to the west of that. You will see the Bonzo uh, crossing. Not very far from the junction of that turn. Then it takes you to Sydney's down. Okay, copy that text. Thank you. Okay, well, some good news. Uh, not regarding my tracking skills. Um, but with regards to Texans' tracking skills, um, he's found the tracks of the Inkawuma Pride, as I'm sure you've gathered by now, coming back to Juma. So we'll head back there to give him a hand. But I am intrigued to see what this leopard does. So maybe let's just continue on this leopard's tracks for a little bit. At least Texan and his tracker are 
out there patrolling. This leopard would have been moving down this road sometime last night, just after the rain. That's why the ground was soft and it received his tracks quite well and left a deep impression. Lucy, as well as Andrine, have given me good scores for my leopard scent marking impersonation. Thank you very much. You must be in a very generous and kind mood to have thought that was any good. Um, and Anne has mentioned that I must smell like buttered popcorn, and that's something that I should have mentioned, uh, and I forgot to. So thanks, Anne. The smell of a leopard scent mark smells just like buttered popcorn. Can you believe it? So, quite a bizarre reality that that's what the uh, scent mark smells like. Anyway, sadly, I couldn't smell any there, otherwise I would have probably been more inclined to tell you about it. But thanks, guys, for your kind words, and thanks, Anne, for reminding me about the smell of the pup buttered popcorn. In the meantime, though, we are going to be spending you to some animals that smell nothing like buttered popcorn, the buffalo. Hidden in the block, we've just stumbled across the breeding herd of buffalo that was reported to cross into Boyatella. I'm going to go forward a bit, see if we can get a better view of them. Now, what's been really interesting with this particular drought and the effect that it's had on buffalo herds is that whilst when I first started working here, we regularly see herds of up to 400, 500 individuals. The herds that we're seeing have fractured now and are much, much smaller in size, usually numbering about 100 to 200. Hello, old girl. But the nice thing that we've started noticing is the birth of the new calves. I'm just keeping my eyes peeled. Our regular viewers know very often we'd sit right in the middle of buffalo herds and we'd be completely surrounded. But at the moment, there's not that many buffalo wandering through here. Let me go forward to get a view of the ones on my left. Uh, apparently, Taxon has just found the tracks of the Nkumumas coming south onto Buyatella, quite far from where we are now. But it's not impossible that they would be attracted to the sound. Sorry, Goody. Sorry, sorry. It's all right. It's OK, big girl. A little sub adult there. Not impossible that the Inkuhumas would be attracted to the sound of these buffalo. The sound and the smell, and very often when we encounter breeding herds like this, there'll be one member or two members that move, making that sound will attract the lion's attention. Little calf off to the right. On our left, a female with very interesting, quite thin horns, even for a female buffalo. They don't have nearly the same. Oh, she's going to go hide her head behind a bush as I'm trying to talk about her horns. And they have nearly the same thick horn base that the males do. It's quite a clear, it's noticeable sexual dimorphism between the males and the females. I think my best approach actually to try and get a nice clear view of these buffalo once we've had a look at this female will be to loop around them. Now they're heading towards as a thoroughly water dependent species they're going to be searching for a drink at some point this afternoon. I think they might be possibly thinking of popping their nose in towards Buffers Hook Dam. Interesting to know whether or not they've realized that that dam has completely dried up because that seems to be their general direction of movement. Once they get there and realize that there's no water, they're going to have to carry on and move towards Buyatella Dam. Now, if the Uncahumas have decided to come through in that direction, they could very possibly meet in the middle. On a day like today, if the weather continues the way it is, our night drive this evening could promise to be exceptionally exciting. 
if the Inkahumas and the buffalo herd happens to meet another female in the back there, you'll notice for a, an animal that is predominantly a grazer, the buffalo have definitely been targeting the trees more and more frequently to try and increase their level of nutrition. There's not much value in the grasses at the moment. And as we've said before, this is just the beginning. The impact of the drought is going to last for months. Apparently the next big predicted rains are going to be in our next rainy season, which for these buffalo mean that they've got to get through this dry season right through towards October, November, before the rains come through properly once again. Maybe it is a slightly bigger herd than I realized. There's quite a few more individuals in front of me. All definitely making their way towards Buffalo Soup Dam. Hello, Buffalo. But you can see how scattered and spread out they seem to be when you compare the way that they were a couple of months ago. These animals would be packed together. gentleman checking us out he's going to be a beautiful big boy and then the cow at the back those bald patches around their eyes that almost all buffalo have are patches that for the most part have been rubbed because they've got as with all both bovids and antelope species they've got glands known as pre-orbital glands around their eyes and they use those to rub on bushes particularly with the males that's what causes those bald spots close to the eye. They can also be fairly prone. Have a look at this buffalo desperately trying to. You can see how far they have to move between mouthfuls. And this little boy is going to be a magnificent bull when he grows up. He's still young. I would say only about two or so years old. In the next few years, he's going to reach his prime. Very good looking young male. No bald patches on his skin, got a nice thick neck developing. Definitely attractive as buffaloes go. I'm trying to get a rough estimate of how many buffalo are in this herd. Not that many. It's probably, I would say, somewhere in the region of about 100 to 200. It's difficult to tell in this thick bush. Why are you so nervous, Buffalo? I wonder whether they haven't been hunted at some point by the lions. Probably last night in the windy weather. I've heard reports that at least two of the Birmingham boys are around in Coral and Torchwood. And the tracks of these buffalo came from that area. And that, I think, is why they're a little bit skittish. That combined with the windy weather has put them on edge. Yes, we're looking at you. Another good-looking buffalo boy. You can see he's still young still with tufts of hair around the base of the horns and as he gets older the bone will more and more bone will be laid down on what's known as the boss at the base of the horns a very thick patch of bone and that will slowly rub away the hair as he gets older and starts to really compete for access to the females not sure how clearly we'll be able to see it but if we look up around his shoulders and his back you can see those faint lines in his fur. It's almost like he's been raked. And that's just from walking through the bushes. The thorn trees and the bushes and the twigs have scraped along as they move through. Now, a stampeding herd of buffalo does not stop for any obstacles in its path. I've, I had one incident where a female, a cow was giving birth and for some reason it ignited an incredible excitement within the herd. Hello, girl. Yes, I'm talking about you. That typical curious buffalo posture. Head up, nose up, 
I think that's a good sniff. The eyesight is not fantastic, but their sense of smell is extraordinary. It's their first line of investigating the world around them. But yes, I was saying how this buffalo birth that I witnessed ignited a very curious behavior known as pregnancy hysteria. And apparently it's recorded in cows as well, where the rest of the herd were so excited by the, the smells that this female was giving off that they started harassing her. And the entire herd ended up stampeding and chasing her. Very difficult sighting to watch, and actually she ended up seeking refuge behind my vehicle, which was not an ideal position to be in, because I was watching them crash through trees and bushes that I would have thought would definitely have stopped them. Yes, a stampeding herd of buffalo is not to be trifled with. Something that I know we experienced when we watched the Inkahumas chase the buffalo herd up to quarantine. Scott was out jogging on quarantine and he just saw a rapidly approaching dust cloud. We then had to race to go and rescue him and fetch him when it became clear that the buffalo were heading in that direction. I'm going to return to this herd of buffalo. I want to see if I can spot a newborn calf for you. But I have spotted another baby animal and I don't want it to disappear. Just before this little zebra fall disappears, I'm going to get you a view and I will come back across towards the buffalo herd. I know, Andrine, you were wondering about telling the difference between males and females. Andrine, I mean, I'm trying to find you a really nice example. And I'll do that in a moment. I just want to get a good view of the zebra foal before it disappears. Well, we might have a nice example here. Let's just stop. So, Andrine, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you this buffalo bull over here. Have a look at the base of his horns. You see how thick the bone is around where the horns meet in the center of his head without any kind of tufts of hair or anything like that. Now, generally, if you're seeing buffalo in thick bush, you might not be able to see the most obvious way of telling the difference between males and females. This is a nice example of a full-grown buffalo bull. Oh, sorry, Adrian. It was Adrienne's question about telling the difference between males and females. Now, if we go, there we go. There's a nice obvious difference for Adrienne. In buffalo, it is fairly clear, not just at the base of the horns, but also the natural physical difference between males and females. The penis sheath that sits in the middle of the, almost in the middle of the stomach, between the front and the back legs, and then the testicles, which are also fairly clear. Now, this is a nice example of a clear difference or a fully grown male buffalo. But what I'm going to do now is try and find you a good example of a female. Here we go, this cow that's walking in front of us. Come on, girl, I need you to look this way. Oh, that's terribly inconvenient. All right, there we go. The base of the horns, much less bone laid down where the horns meet, and very often with tufts of hair. And all that's visible on the belly, since that's what she's presenting to us, is the umbilical cord scar and some nipples between her back legs. So quite a clear difference. I'm just desperately trying to keep track of all of the buffalo that are wandering through. There's another nice example of a male walking in front of me. Now we're moving off once again. Oh, there's one lying down. I decided to take a quick break. Lynn, you were wondering, you said, did, you, did I notice that one of the buffalo had a horn growing backwards, one of the females? And if I'd noticed that or if it was just you, I, I think I did see the one that you saw, Lynn. It's interesting to watch some of the, the defects within horn growth. Sometimes buffalo, of course, break their horns off completely, but sometimes they injure them. And I've seen a buffalo growing one horn down and one horn up, which is quite a bizarre thing to see. We've seen that female with the very long, droopy horns a couple of times around the dam. So, Lynn, definitely not in your imagination. That's usually caused either by a birth, a natural birth defect, 
can be caused by an injury involved or um, obtained when that buffalo is still young. I'll come back to our buffalo and see if I can get an, a clearer example for Adrian. But before I do, let's go and have a look at our zebra. Hello, zebbies. All animals a little bit skittish this afternoon. Could well be the weather. We notice this a lot with animals on cloudy, windy days. Their personal is, is a couple of different levels in terms of describing an animal's personal space and their comfort space. So the first zone that you can enter into is a comfort zone where they ignore you completely and behave as they might normally. The second, which is a clear example for that zebra in the zebra in the road, was their alert zone, which is where they start to notice you, they stick their heads up, they might trot away a little bit and then return again. Apparently the mongoose also dashing about in the screen as well, so keep your eyes peeled for flashes of dwarf mongoose. It's your nice perspective when compared to these horse-sized zebra. Here comes a little fall at the back. Lots and lots of zebra babies at the moment. They don't necessarily have a set breeding time, but they definitely have a peak breeding season. Hello, little one. This one's already a couple of months old. It's lost its baby fluff. If you've seen brand new zebras. Nice large herd. There's quite a few of them coming through. I counted at least 10. There's probably even more here. That appears to be the crossing point. I'm not even going to think about making a zebra crossing joke. I'm going to resist the temptation. Although I feel as if I've already, I've already hinted at it. That's, that should be sufficient. A hint at a zebra crossing joke. There's more zebras crossing. A nice large breeding herd. See them nice and relaxed. Very common to see animals like zebra and buffalo moving in areas together. The more eyes that you have on the ground, the better. The most typical association is between zebra and wildebeest. <laughs> Little one. Now, much more difficult, since we discussed the difference between male and female buffalo, when this zebra, the large zebra on the right of your screen, swishes her tail, have a look at the stripe between the cheeks of her bottom. The thicker and darker the stripe means it's a female, whereas with thin stripes, almost like a barely visible stripe between the cheeks of the bottom means it's a male. So not nearly as clearly visible unless the male is feeling particularly energetic when you're viewing him. You won't be able to see it clearly. The penis is retracted right back into the belly. And the best way to tell is to actually look at that stripe. <laughs> this male impala has just come dashing in and scared the zebra. He's going to walk into frame now. Or come through here is on the right. Oh, the males in parlor are starting to rut and he just scared them. There he goes, he's wandering off on the right of your screen. And then he's running behind the rest of the zebra. Okay, we're obviously having a bit of a fight. And it's amazing to watch the instinct of the prey species or the animals that are constantly hunted. Even when it's not clear immediately what the source of the panic is. As soon as that impala came racing towards the zebra, they immediately took off. Oh, we've got a plethora of animals today. There's a young male waterbuck as well. Hmm, Buffles Hook Bit Dam is the place, or close to Buffles Hook Dam is the place to be. Let's try and get you a view of our waterbuck. Lovely.
thought about playing shy. I'm going to stop here in the hope that he decides to come out. They are such magnificent antelope. The emblem of the Sabi Sands Reserve that we operate in. Come on, boy. Those perfectly symmetrical horns. And it actually, looking at his horns, brings me back to Adrian's question. Adrian's question. And I was going to answer it by looking at the buffalo, but I can answer it just as, just as well looking at the water buck. For all of our bovid species, um, let's not talk about giraffe, let's leave giraffe out of it for the moment. But for, for the most part, bovids, so including buffalo and the horned antelope, such as the water buck, Adrienne was wondering if with the buffalo, the boss, the base of the horns is, oh, sorry, it was Monique in London. Monique was wondering um, with the boss at the base of the horns, of the at his bone and the rest of it keratin or whether or not it's bone all the way through so my answer is the same for both the antelope species and the buffalo while we look at his horns sticking up over the top of the bushes monique with buffalo and with antelope it is bone all the way through so they start growing up from the growth points at the top of their head and then that black spiraled grooved shape on top of his horns as he wanders off that is the keratin sheath now monique what i'm going to try and do for you is i happen to know where there is a buffalo skull there's another water buck it's all action around here monique i'm going to try and find you either an antelope skull or a buffalo skull i know that you are specifically about buffalo a buffalo as well is bone all the way through to the top and it's the outside layer that is a keratin sheath. And that quite often in situations where there is a kill and the skull is left behind, quite often that keratin sheath is chewed away by hyenas that nibble along it, but you should be able to see little bits of it. So that's something that I'll look for. Now, the, both the keratin and the bone is home. Oh, I think I'm actually going to save this. My next, what I was going to talk about, I'll save it. You have to stay tuned when I get to the buffalo skull that I'm thinking about. It's a tricky block, this. Very densely vegetated. Try and get another view of our zebras. Ah, exciting news for all of you. One last view of the zebra looking through at us and I'm going to definitely tell you something that will make you particularly happy. I believe that Scott has found some very sleepy kitty cats. So let's find out who he's looking at. Well, we owe a very big thank you to Taxon and Fanwell and his guests who found, there they are, they're just leaving, they waited for us to get you, thanks Brian. Um, they found these line and I am scratching my head. Like I said, Nikki and I came here, we drove along this road, well along a road that is close enough to certainly see these lion from and we didn't spot them, neither their tracks. So minus five points for our tracking exercise today. But at least the ladies are here. And now we have to put on our patient pants because for now it does not look like they're gonna get active anytime shortly. The joy of this whole situation though is that we simply do not know whether they will in fact sleep for much longer or whether some potential prey might come past that herd of buffalo that Jamie's with would be a perfect alarm clock to wake up these ladies. But anything can happen, and now that we've got them locked in our sights, we will not be leaving them, I don't think. Not on a cool day like this. When initially I heard that Taxon found them, I was convinced that they must have moved during the middle of the day, but I did double check the tracks coming across the cut line and they were in fact a little bit after the rain. So maybe they made a small kill somewhere in here nearby. 
Um, even though they don't look uh, extremely full-bellied and or bloody, they may have killed something small, like an impala that's, you know, kept them comfortable, kept their hunger at bay. And that's why they may not appear to have fed on too much, but that'll also explain why they haven't probably moved too far from where we last saw them at about 7.30 last night, just north of our boundary, not at all far from Sydney's waterhole here. Now, well, who's who within this pride is hard to tell at the moment. It is comprising of five ladies of various ages, probably ranging from about eight years of age to about three and a half to four years of age. So there's a healthy mix of different age lioness within you, but it's difficult to tell them apart. some fascinating information, or, or at least I have for the first time, from Sarah in Ohio. Now, I just mentioned that it can be difficult to tell these ladies apart. For Sarah in Ohio, it's probably less difficult because she spends a whole bunch of time researching this pride of lion and has found out some really fascinating information about them, the following of which I'm going to share with you. And that is that in 2008, there was a young male lion who was apparently blinded by a spitting cobra and then later killed by the Styx pride. And that's really fascinating to hear. Um, I would love to know how anyone can be certain that it was a cobra. Obviously, if it was had perfect vision one day and then was blinded the next, the most likely cause you would, out here would be a cobra. It's not just automatically gonna go blind, especially if it's young. But that's fascinating, and I've never personally heard of any confirmed animals being blinded by a cobra. I would have thought that maybe it would have caused infuriating pain, but not necessarily blinded the lion. Of course, us as humans are often less resilient than wild animals, so even though the cobra may well blind us, I often give animals more credit when it comes to self-healing than we than, than, than I do with us. Sir, so you'd also like to know if I have ever you know, heard of any other stories of it happening to lion or leopard, and no, I haven't. Nothing confirmed, but I guess a lot is unknown with regards to what may happen, Archer, as we are not with these animals every minute of the day, so hard to be certain what injuries are caused by what animals. And I've never seen lions interacting with a snake. I've seen a leopard interacting with a python, which was awesome. Um, sometimes leopards will manage to kill pythons and feed on them, but in this case, the leopard got shown up and fought against it after the python lashed out at it a few times. Darlene in New Hampshire and you ask a question that uh, is a good one because it's it's an interesting it's an interesting one and a tricky one to answer con concisively but I'm convinced that my answer will be the case and you would like to know if lions will be able to distinguish between the scent mark of individuals and yes I think most certainly they will they'll also be able to distinguish between the roars of individuals whereas for me, a lion's roar, even male or female, sounds the same. Let alone one female from another sounding different. But I guess to them, the noise of a human speaking all sounds very, very similar, and they can't distinguish my voice from Jamie's. Maybe mine from Jamie's is a bit easier than mine from Prince, for example. Um, but yes, most certainly, they must be able to tell the difference between 
one another's scent marks, otherwise they would, nobody would know who's who and then scent marks would not be applicable. It would just smell like lion and lion need to know who the individuals are so they can keep track of who trespassers may be. So I think their sense of smell is acute enough to be able to distinguish between different individual scent marks. If it wasn't, then I mean, how would you know that the scent mark from another male lion is not one from your coalition member and vice versa? So I think that should answer your question, Darlene. to Ryan and you are convinced that these ladies are going to continue sleeping for another hour and you could be right but you see what happens as soon as you think about them not moving they move even though this is not the exact movement we were hoping for this is my fear Ryan that if we do move off now they're going to get up and or something is going to come here like a warthog is going to come running through and they're going to jump on it and we're going to hear the squealing from a kilometer away and miss out on all the action. So on a cool day like this, I, th I think it is worth our bet and, and something, it's, it's always a toss up, Ryan, and, 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 and not, never an easy decision for us or the cameramen who, who are obviously involved in making decisions. Do we stay or do we go? We often include you guys. But what we need to remember is that in order for wildlife uh, filmmakers to get the shots that you see on documentaries, these guys employ patience like you cannot believe. They spend countless hours with these animals to get the right shots. Now, I understand that we aren't filming a documentary and we're taking people on a safari, but we do have the joy of cutting across to Jamie's vehicle uh, to get the change of scenery, and that allows us to kind of invest time with them in the hope that we will be able to see them doing something cool. So, even though I do agree with you, uh, and often I've got itchy feet to move on, for, for some reason today I'm, I'm, I'm feeling uh, more patient than normal. So um, apologies for your itchy feet, but I think we are going sit to <laughs> sit this one out. Ideally, I mean, we would have 10 vehicles driving around and then it wouldn't ma matter for one person to stay here and bank it. But even with just two of us, like I say, we do have Jamie searching out for other things, so we can send you across there if you're ever feeling a little bit restless. Um, but I think on a cool day like this, it is going to be worth sticking around. They're also not incredibly full belly. They are looking comfortable, but could do with another meal. So that's also definitely in our favor. The one last thing, and maybe one thing that will allow us to do a loop around is if another vehicle comes here, that way they can tell us, look, you know, the lions are on the move or there's something happening, then we can rush back. But to just leave them here unattended, you can imagine Brian and I are going to be driving around going, I wonder what's happening with the lion. I wonder what's happening with the lion. Maybe we should go back to the lion. So if we could get somebody else here, which I think may happen, then we'll shoot off and do a loop around. But until such point, we're going to have to just try and be patient. Jack as well, who's on Ryan's boat, but Catherine and I'm sure many others are saying, don't move a muscle. I'm happy to watch these sleeping ladies and wonder about what they're dreaming about. But yeah, it's never, never an easy decision. Well, this is an interesting update from Penny Pine. So thank you for sending this through. And you say that uh, many years ago, I think 16 years ago, there was quite a lot of research done on big cats because apparently there was a sudden retina 
something something or other disorder. So basically, the lions were losing function of their retinas out of the blue, all of a sudden. And Penny, I'm wondering if they got to the bottom of it. Was it like a, a virus going around or what, you know, what caused that? I mean, I wonder what came of that research, but it is fascinating to hear that those symptoms did actually occur, that, you know, these animals were fine one day and obviously blinded the next. So an interesting phenomenon that I haven't heard of, so thank you for imparting that info with us. Again, the beauty of being on the biggest safari vehicle in the world is that you do get all these interesting nuggets of information from some of the well-versed, well-seasoned safari goers. to Paul Young, and I don't uh, recognize your name, so good to hear from you. And if it is your first time chatting with us, please let us know. Paul, you're interested to know about the dynamics of male lions with regards to being a part of a pride and their hunting contributions uh, to that. Basically, how it works is that any young males born to a pride will be lazy Yes, but will certainly assist and sometimes be pivotal in helping a pride of lion to hunt. Um, in this case, there was a young male that was in this pride up until about probably three or four months ago was the last confirmed sighting of him. He was called Junior, and he was a big, powerful young male who, you know, in the case of a, a buffalo hunt, would be hugely valuable to help bring down large prey. Obviously, when they're stalking in parlor, and he's 500 meters behind, slowly, you know, moving along to stay with the prey. He's not going to be much good and more of a hinder hindrance then. He's going to try and steal the kill from the ladies. Um, but they certainly can contribute to hunting and can be uh, very, very useful to a pride. Like I said, though, in the same breath, when the pride catches a smaller animal, those young males can be more powerful than their mothers and therefore steal the kills away. So it's kind of six of one and half of a dozen of the other, but it's important to know that male lions can hunt. When a young male or his brothers leave um, and form a coalition, like we've got at the moment, a coalition of five males, the Birmingham males, what they will do is they will be alone. They're not going to have mom and aunt to catch food for them that they can steal from them. They're going to have to find all their food alone, which is testament to the fact that male lions can hunt when necessary and they can be highly effective at bringing down larger prey that the lioness will sometimes battle to bring down. So they can be killing machines. The Birmingham boys are so good at killing buffalo that they can kill one, feed on the, a little bit, carry on moving, kill another one, leave the rest behind. I mean, it's just an absolute joke. They don't even worry about where their next meal is coming from because they are such effective killers of large prey. Um, the second part of your question, I'm just going to be need, need to be reminded of a little bit. You're interested to know about the dynamics of how a, a male lion, when returning to uh, a lioness that it may have mated with, how will it be certain that uh, it is actually its cubs, not, not the cubs of another male lion? I think that was the gist of your question. And it's, it's an... It's an <laughs> It's, it, it's, a, it's a complicated one for me to answer, and even one that I've thought about. I mean, with the coalition of lions, and I think, Ginny, you're also interested in this, you'll find that possibly they're going to split up into two groups. So if it's a coalition of five, you may find two heading to the northern frontier of their territory and the other three heading to the southern t uh, frontier so that they can effectively check and monitor their territory and make sure there's no intruders. Now, while that's happening, you may find the two males may come across one of the prides within their territory and one of those lioness will be in season and one of those males will get to mate uh, with that lioness after probably a little bit of an ar argument with his uh, coalition partner. The strongest of those two will mate with the lioness. Now the other three males are not going to even know about that. They're not going to have seen it happening. Whether the other two when they are going to meet up with the other three again do they think they say, well, you wouldn't believe it, but uh, Jack and Susie, they had a little bit of a thing, so they're expecting uh, some cubs in three months. Uh, it's, 
it's possible. I mean, because that's the only way that I can explain that when the other three males all come in and join, that they are comfortable with the fact that one of their coalition members is the father. Because if they weren't, they would kill the, uh, those cubs. Um, good question. Um, possibly um, it's just that uh, they, they kind of blanket, uh, have a kind of blanket policy where they know their dominance, they're checking the territory, therefore, if they're not finding any signs of any intruders, they are going to safely assume that one of the coalition members will be the father of those cubs. Therefore, all of the cubs within their territory, within that given time frame, will be accepted. If there was an intruder during that period that they could smell or hear calling or that they had an altercation with, maybe that would cause them to start asking questions and be like, oh, hang on, maybe the other coalition member was the father of these cubs, so maybe we should get rid of them. I'm not too sure. Uh, station on Sunny Patch, I've got your audio. Um, so, there's another vehicle that was just uh, arriving, so I just wanted to let them know that I can hear them so that he doesn't go racing past us. So I got a hold of them just in time. And they're coming here. We're seeing the lion, they're rolling around a little bit here. So this is good. Just like us in the morning. It takes a little while to get going. She got a wound on her foot there. It looks like it might be. Well, you know, there's something not quite right with her toes there. I haven't noticed that before. Maybe it's a little recent injury. Nothing serious, just a little bit of a flesh wound. But we'll keep tabs on that. Hello, Casey, in New York. You are interested to know whether or not lion cubs' survival rate is statistically better than that of leopard cubs. And to be honest, I don't know a definitive answer regarding research in any given area, because that will obviously play a, a big part in the success rates. Some areas will have better uh, success rates with lion cubs, and some will have better success rates with leopard cubs. But all in all, I think it's pretty much equal, you know. They, they are all up against such, such bad odds and so many possible enemies when they are little fur balls that, you know, even lion cubs will be killed quite often. Again, often by male lions that aren't their father. If not that, possibly hyena, possibly even a leopard when, you know, a, a leopard can sneak in and snipe one, even though it's probably not as common as lion killing leopard cubs. That anything can happen. And like I say, I don't know any definitive figures regarding that, but in my history, I can assure you, many, many lion cubs that I've seen don't make it to adulthood. <coughs> if anybody can furnish us with some concisive stats, that would be wonderful. I sadly don't have any on the tip of my tongue. Oh, bless you. You've got a little furball you're trying to get rid of. Hmm. OK, well, as these lionesses slowly begin to toss and turn, I think they are hopefully in the process of ever so slowly waking up. We're going to send you across to Jamie for a quick update on how her evening is coming along. We started off, or close to the beginning of, our sunset safari with a sub-adult kudu bull. I've just found the most magnificent adult bull, fully grown with that full twist, two to three twists of the horns. But he's being terribly, he's on a mission actually. He seems to be on his way somewhere and I'm gonna try and get you another view. He hasn't stayed still for one second. Ah, oh, here we go, we should get everything open, nice. There's not much more in the way of dignified animals than this. Hello, beautiful. Yes, stop right there for us for one second. Here's that muscular neck that I was talking about, and then the three, or in this case, two, 
twirls of the horns. Isn't he magnificent? And to me, they always looked as though somebody's dripped wet paint down their back. And it's the stripes are like the runoff down their sides. Well, Teresa told me the most. Teresa's one of our viewers. She told me the most amazing local tale about how the Kudu and the Anyala, with their skinny legs, were not able to stand easily at the, the time of their creation. And so the god reached down and lifted them up. And the white patches are where the hands of the god touched them. I absolutely love that. In terms of local tales and explanations behind animal coloring, I think that has to be one of my favorites. Hello, boy. Don't stress. I know you're hiding there, but he might come out into the open. There he goes. You can see, you can almost imagine the hands of the whatever god happened to create them reaching down and touching them and lifting them up. It's a stunning tale. Oh, I was on my way to collect that buffalo skull for Monique's question, but a kudu is one of the antelope where you can actually slide the sheath, the keratin sheath, off the horns itself, if you ever happen to find a kudu skull. And that originally was the origins of an instrument, if we can call it that, known as the vuvuzela, which was introduced into football games or soccer games, if you're American or South African, soccer games, as a type of encouragement. It's like a little trumpet. But the original form was made from the hollow sheath of a kudu horn. That was then, a hole was made in the tip and that you could blow down. Almost like the way in which some local tribes, for example, in the more tropical areas, use conch shells to create that trumpeting sound. In Africa, they used kudu horns, creating a deep bellowing sound. It's been so cooperative. I hope I don't go any closer in case he runs away. Thank you, boy. And I think he's going to move in front of that badly placed bush willow. There's also a rumor when he tilts his head back like that. Now those horns, just imagine racing through the bush with those horns and the weight of them and having to tilt their heads back to be able to get under the trees and the bushes as they escape from any kind of predator. And there was this rumor that Kudu had hollow horns with a hole at the tip. And when they tilted their heads back like this, they could roll their eyes into the back of their skulls and look through their horns to look back at a predator chasing them. And that is definitely not the case. It's just more the fact that they have to duck their heads backwards in order to escape and get through the thick woodland in which they live. So it's one of those interesting evolutionary tactics. For the males, they need those horns. Look at those spectacular spirals. That's not often a perspective that you get to see of a kudu horn. Look how much more spiraled the one on the right appears to be than the one on the left. Oh no, they are, they are asymmetrical. It's just the angle that we had it at. That's magnificent. But yes, in the thick vegetation, kudu horns like this are actually a disadvantage. So the females don't have them. But the males do as a way of competing for, with other males for the attention of the ladies. Not uncommon for Kudu to actually two bulls of this size to get embroiled in a fight and to wrap those horns around each other and actually get stuck. And now looking at it from this perspective, you can understand how that would occur. Linking together, and then obviously they don't know exactly how to work together to untwist themselves. And it's not uncommon for Kudu bulls to die in that manner, trapped together. Just have a look at the width of his neck. We always have those long, graceful necks, but the males have to have incre incredible muscular power to carry the weight of those horns. He is glorious. So nice and relaxed. What an absolute treat.
definitely, I think, would win the bush, what would we call it? If we ever had a pageant or a beauty contest, I think that a crew would be a definitely high contender. but such a peaceful, dignified sighting that was. While we watch him walk away, Christine is sent through a wonderful sentiment or a wonderful thought. Christine was taking a late night walk yesterday and enjoying the peace and quiet and looking at the deer around her and she apparently was thinking of her friends in Africa and wondering a little bit about us as well as her, her wild earth safari family. I was wondering is it a bit more restrictive in terms of being out in the African bush? Because you can't really go for a nocturnal walk out here. And Christine was wondering, when we go to other cities, do we ever find that sort of lingering sense of unease or looking back over our shoulder? Christine, oh look, I'm South African, so looking over our shoulder and a lingering sense of unease in the city is a fairly standard response, <laughs> to be completely honest. Probably more sensible than feeling uneasy in the bush. Um, but, Christine, what I find when I go back home into the city, or go back to visit my parents in the city, because this is now very much my home, what happens to me is it's not so much a sense of unease or looking over my shoulder, as I have to do now to reverse, so give me for one second. But what I find is I almost get overstimulated in terms of particularly the sounds that the city produces. Now, as bush people, we never switch off that observation sense. You're constantly, even if you're just driving, for example, to the gate to pick something up, or you're driving from home to the camp, or whatever we happen to be doing, that sense of observation is constantly going. Whenever we're sitting outside, there's a part of our brain that is listening all the time to whatever sounds the bush happens to be producing. And you listen to the bird calls, and you're, even if you're having a conversation, part of you is working out what bird is calling or what frog is calling, testing ourselves and our knowledge and our observation skills all the time. I find when I go back into Johannesburg or one of the other cities, I find that for the first three days, I feel quite overwhelmed by sound, whether it's traffic, um, sirens, the television, anything I've got. And I've lived without television for the last close on 10 years. This is the first time I've ever lived in a place, in a camp that actually has, the te has a television, and I hardly ever watch it. But, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is, it, it is one of those things, it's not a sense of unease, but it's just an inability to switch off that awareness for a while and get used to, once again, the sounds of what's going on around you and being able to tune those out in a way that I, I imagine most of you who live in the cities do automatically. As I make my way towards that buffalo skull for Monique, let's just pop back across to Scott and find out what those lions are up to. Okay, well, as you all can see, not too much has changed here. Still five sleepy lioness and Ryan and Jack, you'll be very happy to hear that Brian and I cannot sit here patiently any longer. We have exhausted our patience resources and we'll be heading off to do a quick 10 minute loop. And apologies for contradicting myself earlier, but there is a method to our plan here that we are justifying our lack of patience for, with, and that is that we are going to drive around the block that encompasses these lines, so the roads that will encompass this block that the lines are in, in the hope that we'll maybe find some possible prey. 
And even though that makes no difference to whether or not the lions will catch them, at least we will know whether or not anything is nearby. There is also Sydney's water hole, which is uh, close to us, and maybe there'll be some animals drinking there. It's a beautiful view overlooking it, and I think it's safe that a 10-minute gamble is one we can handle. So, start your stopwatches. It's, um, according to my watch, about just before 10 to, to 6. There we go. So we've got until just after 6 o'clock to get back. Let's let the Ferrari safari begin. Oh, let me just find my mobilizer. There we go. Very good. Please do not catch or kill anything while we are gone. Otherwise, I will be in deep trouble. Of course, the difference in my excuse is that the cameramen who have to sit waiting patiently watching Lion, they can probably read a book or have a beer while they're waiting. They don't have to chat to people and answer questions about sleeping animals. They can just, you know, sit there patiently. So there is a difference between a wildlife cameraman and what we are doing. And to make a sleeping lion entertaining for three hours um, requires, I don't know, some, some skills that I have yet to discover. All right, here we go. The sun's poking out a little bit, so we're going to get some beautiful views. And we're going to send you over to Jamie, and she's found the carcass of the buffalo that she told you she was heading off to. And I'm sure she also told you that it was these ladies that took that buffalo down. Enjoy. Awesome. So here we go. An answer, a very convenient answer to Monique's question about the keratin sheath and the boss and the bone and all of that. And I happen to know exactly where this buffalo skull was. Some of you may be wondering, because we've spoken before about the fact that there's a drought and that we don't generally like to touch animal carcasses at this time of year and in this kind of situation, due to the slight, very slight, but a distinct possibility of anthrax. The reason I've touched this buffalo, and some of you might recognize where we are, this big open area. I know exactly what killed this buffalo, it was the lions of the Unkahuma pride that you've just been with with Scott and it was the kill that Brent managed to catch on live television a couple of months ago. There you go, this is what the buffalo skull now looks like. What would that be, about eight months, nine months down the line? You can see the nose has been pretty much chewed off by the hyenas but what I really wanted to show you was the way in which their horns are structured. So this is the boss. This is what we talk about when we talk about the boss and this bone is probably about this thick down towards the skull protecting the brain case and providing a sort of a perfect cushioning for when buffalo charge and headbutt each other and when they do really seriously fight the impact that they can gather imagine 900 kilograms racing towards another 900 kilogram animal moving at a speed of 15 meters per second that's about 30 feet per second at full speed and impacting and that is what this boss is for this is why the males are so much more pronounced because they spend their time fighting with each other so this spongy bone very well supplied with blood vessels i can see lots and lots of holes from where the blood has moved through this is a living bone and the living bone extends all the way outwards along the horns but what's nice about this particular example and the fact that we can see it so clearly is as it started to get older the keratin sheath as it's dried has pulled back slightly and you can really clearly see where it meets the head so monique usually that this this part would be covered with flesh soft flesh and skin so in that sense you are correct the boss is pretty much entirely bone but this is where the keratin sheath starts and continues all the way up around it's the most amazing fascinating material and i'm actually getting distracted while i'm looking at it I'm forgetting what I was going to say because I'm so fascinated by what we're looking at. But this is the keratin sheath that the bone does extend all the way to the end of the horns. So that will be covered in a layer of about this thick all the way through this keratin layer. It's been slightly chewed on by hyenas but not much. And you can see the areas where that keratin sheath has broken down. If I tilt it, 
ever so slightly. It's surprisingly heavy. You can see the places where the keratin has become sort of gnarled and broken down, as we often see with the buffalo. And then what I want to do now, try and think the way through this, is to show you what it looks like underneath. I think I have to turn it around. As I said, it's surprisingly hefty thing. Oh, this is, this is quite a macabre view. If we look at underneath the horn where the axis joint is that joins the neck to the skull, and then underneath you can see where the keratin sheath ends a little bit further along the horns, or begins, depending on how you look at it. But you really get to get an idea of how it's layered all the way around. And when a buffalo breaks its horn, it would be something that is incredibly painful for it because, as I said, it's living bone. It's an injury that does bleed, particularly the closer you get towards the boss or towards the core stump. You really get an idea of the size and the perspective of just how big a buffalo bull is. This was not the largest one, but compared to me, look, I'm not the, I'm not the biggest person in the world, but just compared to me, this would be a terrifying view if it were a charging buffalo at this distance. I don't think it's something I ever want to encounter in my life. I have had a few tree climbing incidents. And then, of course, you've got the lovely knobbled joint around here. Ooh. And the face and the nasal cavities. Since we've got this perspective and I've got the skull out, I don't want to scratch jiggers upon it. But you can see how complex the nasal cavity is in the opening. Can you see that from there, Dave? Perfect. Thank you. Clear. And all of that olfactory sense. Remember how I said earlier today what a keen sense of smell the buffalo has? And if I... Can I climb onto Jigger like this? I suppose I can. Probably the easiest way of doing things. The organ of Jacobson. So when we talk about the animals phlegm and grimacing, where they pull their up lip, top lip up and draw the scent into that organ of Jacobson, or the vomeral nasal organ, that sits at the top of their mouth. It sits just on the top of the palate over here. So it links up completely with the sinuses through here. And then last thing, you can just have a look at the condition of the teeth. Surprisingly sharp molars for an animal of this nature that essentially is entirely grass-based. This was an old buffalo. By the way that the teeth have worn down or cracked and damaged, and the fact that this keratin horn sheath. Oh, and one more thing to show you before I return it to the bush. I spoke, I was going to bring this up before and then I said you'd have to just wait and see. If we zoom in, how am I going to do this? I think this is probably the best. Have a look at this. This is what is going to be responsible for the final breakdown of this keratin sheath. This is what's known as a horn moth and it's in fact the larva or the larvae of the horn moth that are capable of utilizing and breaking down both keratin and bone and in the next few months, in the next few years, you'll find that this entire sheath could well be, car could well be covered in the little tunnels that the larvae make as they break down the bone. And already just looking at it, funnel web spiders have moved in. There's not one single piece of meat really left on this buffalo skull. All right, boy. Thank you, in your death you have been exceptionally educational. Now going to return him. He probably weighs this skull alone. To guess at, I would say, yeah, I'm trying to think of a good comparison. Probably weighs about 15 odd kilograms, 12 to 15 odd kilograms, which is about 25 to 30 pounds. Here we go. He can live out his days, or well, the skull can live out his days for the rest of the time providing some food sources for the larvae of the horn moths and a nice little home for an unnoticed a funnel web spider in there as well. So even, it, it just goes to show how, I'm oh, tangling myself up here, it just goes to show how the bush utilizes every single aspect of a buffalo carcass. Oopsie. Sorry guys, let me try and re-hook my microphone back up. And the evening slowly drawing to a close. <laughs> I 
Neil said that it looked like I was riding a Harley Davidson. With that buffalo skull, Laura said it's almost bigger than I am. It is, it is fairly big. I mean, it really is a massive size that you get that idea of the animal. And of course, they can weigh, a big buffalo could weigh close up to about a ton in weight, which is close to 2,000 pounds. Incredible stuff. So there you go, Ruth and Ruth watching in New Jersey and Mike were wondering a little bit about what a buffalo weighs. And for both of you, okay, when I said that it could weigh close to a ton, that's a really, that's quite a big buffalo bull. That's a huge buffalo bull. The average is probably around 600, 700 kilograms for an average buffalo, in a, an adult average buffalo. Females, of course, much smaller than the males. And it's really only those big buffalo bulls, those dugger boys, that reach those enormous sizes. The 600 kilograms, 700 kilograms between 1,000, <laughs> 1,200 to 1,400 pounds. Give or take roughly. My conversions are not necessarily spot on, but it gives you a rough idea. James Taylor had the same idea or the same thought I did, which was to mount the buffalo skull on Jigger. <laughs> it's an interesting thought, James Taylor. Um, I've thought about it. I think, though, maybe not the image we should be going for. Quite a, quite a macabre image. What a beautiful evening. perspective is a very different perspective of the size of the buffalo and it's something that I've been trying to do more and more regularly is to give you because I understand that watching from where you are you haven't seen the animals before and even when you do see them from the vehicle you don't really get an idea of just how big they really are so that's a nice way of just comparing the size of the skull to me and I mean it's far wider than I am and the fact that the head weighs just the head without any flesh, without any of the brains still remaining in it, weighs close to about, I would say, just under a third of my body weight. Gives you a rough perspective of just how enormous these animals really are. And Spiros Papas, you were also really enjoying that particular sighting. And you were wondering how old that skull was. Now, that live kill, when that buffalo was killed by the Infamous, it was back when Junior was still part of the Pride, back before the time of the Birmingham boys, and it was just three days before I actually arrived at Wild Earth to start working here. So it was a month after my interview, and three days before I started working here, so it makes it the 10th of July. We're in February. And that probably equates to about seven to eight months, that skull is. No, that's an absolute lie. Yeah, no, no, that's right. It's eight months. Eight months old is that skull. Look at this stunning view. We really are so fortunate in the area that we get to work through. London and Monique is wondering a little bit about rhino horn and she's asked she said can I ask about it or is it a no-no our regular viewers know this but for our new viewers we don't show rhino we don't show any signs of rhino that might or may or may not move through the area 
The reason we do that is, although it would not necessarily automatically mean that that rhino would be in danger of being poached, first of all, it's a statement from our side. Second of all, we don't want to increase the risk, even if it's an infinitesimal amount of that rhino, making it a bit easier. We know that poaching is a huge organization, it's got huge finances, and people have access and do patrol social media. So I, I would encourage you, even when you're putting up your photos on Facebook, if you've visited the Kruger, if you are going to do that, please be really careful you don't have geotagging on your phones or on your cameras, and don't specify where you saw that animal. Most people know that, but just a quick reminder. Monique, to finish that question off very carefully, you are absolutely correct. You were saying, interesting that buffalo and antelope have the same horn structure with the bone underneath. Rhino is, you are absolutely correct, rhino is completely different. It is entirely keratin, which is what makes that poaching issue so very frustrating. The use of them in medicinal, traditional medicines, they have absolutely no value. You might as well go and chew your hair or your fingernails for all the good it will do you. No bone structure to rhino horn, but it does dip below the surface of the face. So there's a little bit more that grows underneath where that horn pops out. Uh, we generally don't try to stay too long on the topic of rhino horn, but I just thought I'd give you a little bit of background to that. My next plan of action after a visit to that buffalo skull was to go and see if there's any sign of, or to see whether or not those tracks that Scott found were of Tingana crossing to Buffalo's Hook, or if he's still in the area. And while I do that, let's find out what those buffalo killing in Kuhumas are up to. Well, we safely made it back. We were a little bit longer than 10 minutes, I'll be honest. We were maybe 12 minutes. We found a sum total of three Impala, um, but they were quite far away. That's not to say, of course, that there's not some other possible prey lurking in the thick bush that wasn't close to the roads. So it's very important not to just assume things out here because so much can happen between the road networks. We certainly, I think, it's safe to say, can be grateful that at least they are showing more signs of getting active. That one lioness right at the back there, she's doing some grooming. So, telltale signs of lions that are slowly getting ready for action. But I fear that it may be <coughs> that they only get active a little bit later on, which is not a problem because we have got the late night drive tonight where James and Brent will be heading out. I think James is gonna be on the vehicle with the regular camera using the spotlights and Brent is gonna be on the other vehicle with a high ISO camera that's got very good nocturnal capabilities. We're still uh, you know, beginning to understand that camera and how best to make it work. We also need to hope that the clouds that are around dissipate. And it does look like if they are, Brian, things are looking better than they were before. Um, but there is a thin layer of clouds that is going to kind of diffuse the moon as it's diffusing the sun now that you can see. But Let's hope that the cloud cover does continue to thin out. It's definitely looking better than it did earlier, so that that full moon will help the high ISO camera. But that is the good news. There is going to be a drive later on this evening at around 8 o'clock, so one hour after this safari finishes, Brent and James are going to be going out. Not sure for, for how long. They're just going to go out and, and see what happens and do a few tests on the new camera and see what they can find. And it's just something different, a new adventure that we would like you guys to all be a part of, even though it simply is some testing. But it's not uncommon for us to involve you guys in the test, because why not? We've got nothing to hide and like to share the interesting stuff along the way, just like last night with the thermal imaging, with the drone. It was the first time we had ever tried it, which is obviously a huge risk because we didn't even know if it was going to work. So simply offering and inviting you along for that kind of initial trial is a little bit of a risk, you could say, but we've got nothing to hide and like to share as much as possible of our adventures with you. So that's something to look forward to later on. I'm guessing some of you may not know about that. It's not often that we 
do safaris outside of the regular broadcast times. Look at all the lion's ears twitching, keeping the flies at bay. Hello to R. Beard, who obviously wasn't out with us on a safari a couple of days ago when we did see this pride of lion stalking some Inyala as well as buffalo. I think that was only three or four days ago. R. Beard, it's great to have you with us. And you're, the reason why I know you weren't with us is that I covered your question then, and you were wondering whether or not lion will employ various strategies or tactics with when hunting, i.e. will maybe one try and catch the attention of their prey as the others flank around, or do they all have set roles possibly in the hunting procedure? And to be honest, I think people have given, or well, not everyone, but certain people have given big cats far more credit than they are due with regards to their hunting skills. And I think that they are not the smartest of creatures when it comes to hunting. So I think it's more of they see the prey, they each kind of loop it. Some, oh, yeah, we've got lucky, Brian. Sorry, there's one lion who's up. It may not be for long, so we may as well make the most of it. She may just be going for a toilet break, and then she could flop down in another spot. This, according to Nikki, is the prettiest lioness in the pride. And I'm guessing, like I said, just a quick toilet break, and then a new spot to sleep is what's going to be her plan, but hopefully I'm wrong. No, that looks like a toilet break to me. Okay, so I'll be like I was saying, um, I don't think that they, they, they plan very much. They just sort of see their prey and yes, some will try and encompass, the, the, the pride will split up and try and encompass their prey if one lion sees one going that way, the other one may go the other way to try and encompass them. But it's usually not as efficient and effective, uh, or they are not as efficient and effective as they could be. I mean, often, as a human, with our intellect sitting watching them, you think, why don't you just do this, or why don't you go and do that and loop around or do something else? Um, there's a big yawn there, and hopefully there'll be another one. Again, a good sign of them becoming active. So yes, I, bet I don't. I don't think they use any set uh, strategies or tactics. Or if they are using them, they're not using them very, very effectively. And the proof is in the pudding. I mean, lions and leopards have got a 20% strike rate when trying to bring down their prey. So I guess it shows that their strategies are not the best. Although in their defence, again, the prey has evolved over many years. It looks like this. Lady's trying to cover up her business here. Let's see what she does here. She may, yeah. Interesting that she's deciding to do that there. They won't always cover up their scent or their defecation or their urine. So why she's doing it now, I'm not too sure. Well, that was a little scent mark there. So she went to the toilets. I think she had a pee. I'm not sure if she did anything more serious than that. But then right at the end there, you may have seen a few squirts, and that was a scent mark, and she scraped her foot. So stake and claim to this little corner of Juma before she flops herself back down with the rest of the pride. Oh, I love it when they use branches like that to stretch out their body, and look at her claws sticking out there being protected from their sheath. There they go back in, where they are protected and kept sharp until they are needed, which is hopefully going to be the case within the next 45 minutes that those claws are needed to latch onto something. But for now, I think we're just going to see them possibly latching into that little branch. Another thing that I always wonder about, ooh. Shh, 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 everyone listen.
No, I'm not sure what they heard. But for four of them to simultaneously get up and look in that same direction means obviously something got their attention. The one line, as you can see, doesn't care. Oh, well spotted there, Brian. Nice big yawn. Perfect white teeth. She's one of the younger lioness. You can tell from the state of her teeth. Oh, well. Maybe it's just some thing that they're not too sure about, but we will keep monitoring that. And obviously, good prospects. There could be some potential prey that they've heard. You can never be certain what it is. But all of them yawning now, and when big cats yawn, it means they're trying to get as much oxygen into their bodies as possible, and as much oxygen as they can get in order to get moving. So a great indicator that big cats are gonna become active. Ooh, and the yawns are coming all around. So maybe we are gonna be lucky and see these guys on the move. Big stretch there. Hey, Joel, in New York, you wondering if lions ever get inquisitive and curious for our food. Oh, that one lioness was not interested in the youngster's approach. It was a much older lioness. You'll see she's missing her one tooth. Oh, no, it was such a small, funny yawn that we couldn't see it. Look at how affectionate they are. It's wonderful to see what can be such a terrifying beast be so calm and cool and loving to its own kind. Here we go. Cute. Sorry, Joel. Um, back to your question regarding uh, lions being curious about any kind of tasty treats that us humans may have brought on safari with us. And I have never noticed uh, lions showing any interest in food on our vehicles. Of course, a raw rump steak, not cooked, would be an exciting prospect for a lion. Um, I once had a guest who was sick on a vehicle and vomited off the back, and the lion showed some interest in that. That was an awkward scenario to be in. <sighs> Horrible memories. <laughs> um, anyway, um, <laughs> that's the only time, Joel, that I can think of that lions have showed any interest in human food, albeit regurgitated. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that sends shivers down my spine. It was so horrible. The one guest, it was uh, three different couples on the vehicle. And the one couple were, was a particularly difficult couple that the other two couples didn't get along with. And it was the one partner from that couple um, that was vomiting. So there was no pity felt by the other guests. They wanted to stay with the lions, which were on the move. But obviously, I had to try and tend to this sickly guest who was vomiting off the back of the vehicle. And then the lions came up, and then the lady nearly had a heart attack. Oh. It was also early on in my guiding career, so I wasn't very experienced. Didn't know what to do with myself. <laughs> yeah, that was in the good old days. That was with a pride called the... Oh, I can't believe I've forgotten the name of the pride. <sighs> It was in the western section of the Sabi Sands. Oh, it must come back to me. They're still around. Anyway, it slipped my mind. But in the western section of the Sabi Sands, look at all the ladies. Looks like it's manicure time. Tending to the nails, at least that vicinity of their body. And I'm happy you guys get ready, make your souls look good, and let's go out and hit the town. Hi there, Da in Dakota. And as we watch these wonderfully affectionate scenes, you would like to know if through inbreeding, any of these pride members may carry the black gene, the melanistic gene. 
And I didn't know that you got a melanistic lion. So, excuse me for my ignorance, if that is the case, but I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain that there's no such thing as a melanistic lion. I hope I'm not wrong, um, but I've got a feeling that, that I'm not. So, yes, you get recessive gene being a leucistic lion, um, being white in coloration. You do get melanistic leopards, though, and many other animals. So it's not an impossibility, and it's interesting that you don't get melanistic lions, as far as I'm aware. Jamie, thankfully, agrees with me. Jamie's, I think, uh, more uh, intellectually sound than I am, so very relieved that her brain is also ringing up a blank with regards to black lion, but she does say she has seen photoshopped images. So Da and Dakota, maybe that is what has fooled you. That somebody's been tweaking these lion on Photoshop, causing them to be black. Um, still on the topic though, Da, um, and for those other viewers who don't know, um, too much about white lions or the leucistic lion, the recessive gene, um, you do get them. And currently there are three white lion living in the wild in the Kruger National Park. Two of which are not far away from us at all. There's two lioness in the Timbavati Reserve, again, open to the Kruger National Park. And on a very similar latitude to that, but further east, near a camp called Sitara in the Kruger National Park, near the Nuanetsi concession is a young male who's, I think, approaching two years of age now, and he could well be the first documented big white lion in many, many, many years. I think maybe 20 years ago there was a report of one, um, but since then there have been no wild white lions that have made it to adulthood, so exciting prospects there. And he actually had a sister, so there was two of them within a mega pride of about 40 lions that are roaming through the Lobombo mountain range, very close to the Mozambican border. But the lioness didn't make it. She was a youngster, though, when she died, and like most cubs, both lion and leopard, the stats show that their mortality rate is very, very high. Speaking of which, and stats, Penny Pine, thank you very much for providing us with the stats that you sent through saying that there's about 2,000 leopard apparently in, I think it's South Africa um, at the moment, the last census. Maybe it's the Kruger National Park, the Greater Kruger National Park, apologies, and about 1,400 lions. So there's more leopard than lion, but I was interested to know more specifically on stats on the infant's mortality rates. But still very interesting info, and that's why I thought I would share it with everyone. So there we go. Look at you two. I think these two could possibly be the two oldest lioness in the pride, but maybe I'm wrong. Amber Eyes is on the left. She's got dark orange eyes. Jenny in Texas, you can see this one lioness nibbling off the ticks, or at least attempting to, and you'd like to know if they feed on them and eat them, and yes, they do. As far as I'm aware, they swallow them. I've never seen them spit out a tick that they've plucked off. I wonder how much hair and how much pinching gets done as they try and do it. I mean, it's, it can't be easy plucking a tick off with your teeth. And this is a really, really wonderful display of aloe grooming. Brian's just done a little camera tweak there as the light is fading quite fast as the sun is setting behind the horizon. Whew. I'm glad I don't have any ticks being plucked off by that lady. Look at the size of those canines. Whew.
hello to Chris Applegate on YouTube. And you've called this uh, group of line a pack of line. I just want to gently correct you there. And packs are usually used for dogs and prides for lion. So you wouldn't call a pride of lion a pack of lion, to be grammatically correct. And you would like to know if any of them have set specific roles within the pride. Yes, I guess to a degree. You know, one will probably be in charge that um, everybody needs to um, kind of listen to and follow to. When she gets up and moves, the rest will follow. Um, but no major set roles and responsibilities other than that. Uh, the pride are still in the same place, no changes, just myself here. No problem. Um, apologies, I just wanted to get uh, uh, get on the radio to Abel there, who was calling me for a quick update. And I think he may be coming to rejoin us. So, sorry, Chris, yeah, I mean, there's not any major roles. Some of them, I guess, will do the scent marking. Not all of them will necessarily do it. But because we don't spend every minute of the day with these cats, we don't know you know, and we don't we don't know enough about who's doing what, especially at the moment. There's the last few months have been kind of turmoil with regard to lion sightings and lion dynamics because in around kind of September, August last year, I guess, maybe even a bit earlier than that, the Matimba male lions came through. Apologies, the Birmingham male lions came through. A coalition of five marauding young males looking to prove a point and establish a territory. And that is exactly what they did. They killed three lioness from this pride, possibly a fourth, possibly junior as well, but that's not confirmed, just mere speculation. But they would have certainly done so if they had have got a hold of him. So they killed lioness, they killed cubs from another pride, and they chased away the two dominant males, the Matimba males. And since that's all happened, these ladies have spent quite a long time away from us until quite recently we've been seeing them more and more frequently, which is kind of as it was before the coalition came through. So who's doing what at the moment? I can't be certain, and any specific roles and responsibilities will be difficult to pinpoint. Well, thanks very much for your help, Tony, as well as Karen, trying to work out which prides of lion uh, I've been talking about, one of which was the pride of lion that uh, was subjected to the human regurgitation. And Karen, I think you're right. I think it was the Ottawa pride, but I still think there's another pride, the Shimungwe pride. Thank you. Your, your Ottawa pride helped lead me towards the Shimungwe pride. It's the Shimungwes, which we've actually, I think, seen once or twice here or at least a portion of their pride. So it was the Shimungwe pride that was uh, following us in the western section with that awkward scenario I had with my guests vomiting off the vehicle. Um, and Tony, you've uh, mentioned another pride, the Belele pride, or I, I can't uh, pronounce it very well, in the Timbavati with those white line. The So Belele, um, I don't think Nikki's doing the greatest job in uh, reading it to me. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to drop her, and it's a pr pronunciation of Shangan words can not be the best. She spelt it to me now, but I can't listen to her. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, Tony, it's uh, the, the lion's prides with the white lions within them. The one of the one pride is the giraffe pride in the Timbavati, that's what they're called. They've got two lionesses that are white, and the pride in the Kruger National Park is called the mountain pride with the one male lion. And I think there was a documentary not too long ago that some of you may have remembered watching called Lion Army. I can't remember what channel it aired on, but that was on the mountain pride at that stage. There weren't any white lions in it. But now there are. 
Great. Well, it appears like all the excitement and all the yawning and all the possibilities of these ladies getting ready to go and catch some dinner has diffused and they've gone back to bed. They've hit the snooze button and you'll be glad to know, though, that Jamie has found you guys some action. So we're going to send you across to her vehicle and you're in for a treat. It seems as though the animals of Juma are having something of a lazy afternoon. I've arrived in my personal happy place, which is the hyena den. And at the moment, so far, the only signs of life is one very sleepy, Corky. And in fact, making a nice contra contrast to the well-groomed lions that you were watching with Scott. I'm not sure if it's my imagination or not as we watch her snoozing away. Hello, gorgeous. What's up? What did you see? What did you hear? But to me, she looks as though she's got the residue of blood around her face, around her muzzle, just above the eye. There definitely seems to be signs of feeding there. I think Corky's beautiful, even though James has disagreed at times. Maybe not as well-groomed as the Inkahuma lionesses, but a face I find terribly endearing. Yes, you can see there's also, it looks like, blood around her paws. Sometimes difficult to tell because, as you know, hyenas quite happily will spend the day in a muddy wallow or a pan, which leaves its residue and its marks as well. But I think in this case there's a red tinge to it that suggests to me that it might well be blood. So the... Hyena clan of Juma obviously has had some luck either in hunting or scavenging some kind of carcass. You really get an idea of the thick mohawk that runs down their back. Now, spoken before, I think, about the dangers of using scars as an identifying feature on a hyena. And you can see why Corky, with her semicircle perfect white scars that she had on the top of her forehead, on the top of her skull between her ears. That's nearly vanished. Luckily for us, we've got the nice nicks out of her left ear, or the ear you can see on your right, depending on how you want to look at it. A little pizza wedge out at the bottom and the slit across at the top. That will stay permanently throughout her life, but very often scars come and go and disappear and fresh wounds heal up. We'll never know what made that scar. I personally think it might have been another hyena. And it seems, in a strange way, the funny way the time flies around here, it seems like just yesterday when we discovered Corky sitting at the Philemon's Cutline Den all on her own. And all of a sudden, December 1 and 2 emerged as such a pleasant surprise. Tiny little brand new black balls of fluff before she did us a very convenient favor and moved them all across to the Mvubu Road den. Now she's checked herself out of babysitting duty for now. She's moved away from the den. I'm sure you're all wondering what's happening at the den site itself. Well, the answer is nothing, actually, to be completely honest. One very quiet, very empty den. As I said, I think the animals of Juma are having a lazy... What day is it today? Sunday. Sunday. It is Sunday. Well, then that, that makes complete sense. It's a lazy Sunday afternoon. I respect that. That is what Sunday afternoons are for. So cubs all having a nap inside. I don't see any signs of any of the other adult hyenas coming through. I wonder if the rest of them are still scavenging at whatever carcass Corky happened to have been feeding at. You can see she's taken the opportunity to get away from those sharp nipping teeth and worrying cubs that constantly cause mischief whenever they are awake. I think every mother out there or father, every parent who has had a toddler at some point in their life, whether it be their own children or grandchildren wandering around at this point, will understand exactly how she feels able to escape and settle down a little way away from the den and have her Sunday afternoon in peace. She's also yawning and having a, a little bit of a groom. Or more, more of a, a scratch of her nose. Come on, Corky. 
Hyenas not known, however wonderful they may be, not known for their fastidious and cleanly nature. They're quite happy to sit covered in the remnants of a carcass that they've munched on. You can see she's a little bit on alert. I think it's just because that's what animals do. They can't, they can't really relax fully out in the wild. <laughs> Giving her nose a good scratch along the side there. Corky, you need somebody to come and clean your face, girl. You're looking thoroughly filthy. Very half-hearted clean. Oh, there are those enormous bone-crunching teeth. The teeth that would have been responsible for crushing that front part of the buffalo skull that we were looking at earlier. And the powerful neck and shoulders. Creating muscle points and muscle attachments to create that bite force. Oh, big sigh. As I said, not the cleanliest of animals, and certainly, as with the lions, will be covered in... There you go, she's going to have a quick scratch, probably to dislodge any ticks that might be around, which brings us to... Good scratch. I think she's going to get up and move. I actually think she's going to start wandering off, probably towards Gallego Pan, unless she does decide to go and get her cubs out of the den. But talking about the ticks and the fact that she's having a good scratch, Cecilia was wondering, is it true in times of drought that the animals will have a higher tick load and that by eating them, the lions, the ticks will transfer diseases to something like a lion? Cecilia, in the more an animal loses condition, let's just see what she's going to do. Sorry, Cecilia, I'll be with you now. Just want to see if she's going to... Look at that round belly. Somebody's definitely been munching on something. So Cecilia, typically the wet not, not seasons bad. and the well, big, and the sort of thick, dense vegetation is when you're going to get the most ticks. The reason that t animals might have a higher tick parasite load during the drought is because they lose condition. And as soon as an animal starts to lose condition, their tick count gets higher and higher because they spend less time grooming. Oh, I think she's going to go fetch and cups for us. Thank you, Corky. touch and go 50 50 whether she was going to walk off or go to the entrance to the den and Cecilia in terms of transferring disease most of the animals have a fairly high resistance to the diseases that ticks the rickettsia bacteria that ticks carry in this particular area so it's not really going to cause the lions any more difficulty in fact the ticks in terms of targeting the prey species let's see if she's going to call let's be quiet for a second there you go. I don't know if you can hear that. It's the most amazing low rumble. Oh. That was a very soft contact call. Here we go. Instant response. Hello. Dinner time. For one of the Decembers. Let's see if the second one decides to come out before I reposition. Look at those faces. There we go. Here comes number two. Oh, and a third, just for fun. Oh, there's, it's November that came out there. A slightly bigger cub. Not for you, though, girl. Boy, sorry, November, it's probably a boy. It's not your mommy. Interestingly, unlike the lines that you're looking at with Scott, Oh, hello, there's another little face emerging. Madam's cubs, the January cubs getting brave as well on the left there. Investigating that contact call and back into the den when they realize that it wasn't their mother. Oh, no, there we go, out she come. The youngest additions to the Juma clan family. Back. Just a little bit. Okay. Let's see how our view is from here. Oh, 
Hello. That's not your mom. She's not going to feed you. So interestingly, as I said, unlike the lionesses, hyena cubs or hyenas will not suckle any other females' cubs. What the cub might do is go and have a sniff or a lick around the nipples of another female. That doesn't mean that they are actually being allowed to suckle. You can see the tentative approach there from the matriarch's cubs, the dark, young dark one. It's having a sniff at a female that isn't her mother or his mother. But already with that boldness that having a mother of high ranking status brings, I'm gonna nibble on November's tail in the meantime. It's such a, a privilege to be able to witness these cubs from their very first early tentative days. <laughs> November knocking back into the den. Their tentative days and we look back at November when he was just a little black ball of fuzz starting to investigate very timidly. And then you watch them slowly grow up and that curiosity come through more and more strongly until they come up and investigate right up to your vehicle. It is a privilege to be able to witness that. And it's something that the live safaris bring you that even a safari holiday would not be able to, unless you spent months holidaying at a lodge. Oh, so exhausted. Obviously been a very busy day. Yeah, the Franklin chirping away as the sun starts to go down. I did rush to the hyena den because it is as I'm sure our regular viewers have noticed, it's starting to get darker and darker earlier as we move further into the year. And for new viewers, I cannot put any kind of light or spotlight on a hyena den site with such young cubs. It's just our policy. Oh, we're going to have a game here. So if it does seem a bit dark, that's just the reason why. It provides them with an extra level of stimulation and distraction that they don't need. Oh. Playtime. <laughs> December twins warring for access to nipples at the back there. The January cub climbing all over November. Now wanting to get in on that action. Now this, what I'm going to say next is pure supposition and I'm saying it tentatively. The fact that this hyena cub, the youngest one, the little black cub, the January cub, is out whilst its twin sibling isn't, could be an indication that it is a female. Females are slightly bolder than the male cubs tend to be, and that, of course, is hyena society down to a T. Males are smaller and completely submissive to the females. So, it, it, it's a guess, very difficult to tell with young cubs, particularly at this distance, but there is a chance that we've got one female and one male cub, which is generally, when you have twins like that, that is usually the case with hyenas, that they are one cub of each sex. Corky, are you done already? You went and dragged your cubs out for a, a very brief feed. Oh, we've now got a pile of cubs off to the right. <laughs> Cousins and siblings playing with each other and watching Corky retreat. Let's see how bold they decide to become. Morning, little monsters. Wondering after mom. Oh, very brave. making little squealing beggy sizing and sounds sorry squealing begging sounds I'm not even sure what word just came out of my mouth but I'm pretty sure it was a made-up one 
squealing, begging sounds to try and get more food out of Mom. Oh, got you, got you by the toe, got you by the toe. <laughs> oh. Running away before retribution could occur. Now we've seen the round bellies, but it has been a long time since we have seen the hyenas at a kill site. Doodles, Doodles, Doodles was wondering whether or not we ever, the Safari Live crew ever gets to witness the hyenas at a kill itself. And they've seen the aftermath, bloody faces and round bellies, but never seen them at a kill. And absolutely we have, they've been quite a few occasions where we've been able to witness that. You can, I mean, uh, it's very anthropomorphic of me to say this, but you can almost see the disappointment in Corky's cubs, Corky's December cubs, that they haven't managed to get more food and that mom's wandered off already. I'm slouching off back towards the den. Doodles, we do get to see it. Um, generally, there's a, there's a difference in the different areas between how often a hyena scavengers versus hunts. And quite frequently, we miss those opportunities to witness hyenas going to finish off the remains of something like a lion kill because it happens very much in the middle of the night once the lions have decided to move off a kill like that. And generally, because there's so much access to food here for these hyenas, they don't risk tackling the lions of the area. It's not worth it. It's worth just waiting for the opportunity. Now, hopefully, Doodles, it's going to be one of those things that we'll be able to see more and more frequently as we go into night drives and perfect our technique and work and practice. So don't forget to join us, for example, for this evening's practice drive. There's a practice run, so things might go wrong. Things will have to be changed and practiced and played with. But it will give us opportunities more and more frequently to witness scenes like that. The rest of the cubs, I think, have disappeared into the den. The December twins wandering around the back. I think for us, it is a little bit dark, and I think it's time for us to leave the hyena den. I just had to pop up. I was desperate for an update as to what was happening, as I said, in my happy place. So while I leave the hyena den and the hyena cubs to their mischief, again, something else we would be able to see, to be able to sit and watch this hyena den in the dark without putting any lights on them. Imagine all of the awesome interaction that we could get to see. None of us know what happens at this den site overnight. But while I leave them for now, as the sun starts to disappear down behind the horizon, let's find out what Scott's lioness is up to. Well, very, very happy to hear that all the cubs emerged from the burrows at the high inner den. So your patience paid off there, waiting with the one adult. Our patience has yet to be paid off here, but it's been a very pleasant evening, and we did get to see them do some wonderful grooming. Literally, in the last 30 seconds, though, the wind has just changed. And about five minutes ago, Brian and I noticed that there is a massive pile of lion dung about half a meter from our front right tire, but thankfully the wind has been in our favor up until now. Now, though, we are having to deal with the terrible stench of some lion poop, which, like I said, it's just down here. But thankfully, we don't have too much longer to spend here, so we'll be able to deal with it until such point that we move off and can relieve our poor nostrils. Now, our beard, thank you very much for getting back to us, and Interesting that some 20 years ago, you landed a commercial jet in the Kruger National Park. I'm guessing at the Skakuza airstrip, and that must have been good fun. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about that story, so if you don't mind telling us what you were doing, Archer, that would be great. You mentioned that uh, you asked a ranger in the area f uh, you know, for any precautionary measures that you're going to need to take for your well the well-being of your aircraft while it is on the airstrip and he said that you need to come and just make sure that the tires are all in, intact after it's, I think you said, spent five days there. And that's interesting that he only mentioned that it was the lion that you need to be cautious of because in my history, it's the hyena 
that are the problems on airstrips with uh, airplanes. And actually, not too long ago, when we were driving across on the Arethusa airstrip, we actually saw um, the pilots had piled up a whole bunch of thorny acacia branches around the tires of the airplane to make it difficult for the hyena to, to, to bite onto those tires. But it, it certainly is a problem. I've experienced it uh, at many bush strips along the way. You'll find the pilots getting all kinds of branches. I'm surprised they haven't designed a proper metal kind of box that they can put around their tire to ensure that nothing happens. But apparently, thorny branches is all you need to keep the hyenas at bay. That would be, I guess, a terrible way to start your flights or start your day to arrive at your airplane, only to discover that your tires have been chewed by hyena. A bigger threat and concern for bush pilots, and a real concern, is every time you land, you just don't know what wild animal may run across the airstrip, so you'll find that you may fly low to buzz the animals off. Also, the guides will drive up and down the airstrips before their guests arrive, just to make sure that there's no potential hazards. Sean. On YouTube, you would like to know if they hunt more at night than during the day. And I think in this area of Africa, that's definitely the case. We s tend to find that the lions of the Sali sands are most active at night. But it will change seasonally, and come the cooler winter months, you'll find that they are more active during the day. But that's not to say that they will not hunt if an opportunity arises. So they're not averse to hunting during the day. It's simply easier for them at night under cover of darkness and here in the Sabi Sands often just much cooler and more comfortable for hunting. Having said that though, Brent had an incredible sighting of the same pride of lions taking down a buffalo in the evening with full light up in the sky and no artificial light was needed and that was certainly one of the best hunting moments we've captured since we've been here. Leopards, on the other hand, while we're on the topic of hunting, um, will be a lot more inclined to move during the day in this area. So even though it's very hot, we tend to find that leopards can handle moving in the heat much more than lions do. So they will be more likely to catch something during the day than a lion would, I guess. Still fast asleep, and who knows when they're going to wake up. I hope they're going to be here for the late night drive that's going to be happening one hour after this safari finishes, which will be in the next five minutes. And we always hope that lions are going to get up, but now it's kind of the contrary. We want them to stay put until Brent gets here with that night vision camera. Well, not night vision camera, camera with better night vision capabilities or nocturnal capabilities. Interesting questions just come through from a newer viewer. And that's M. Dakota. And you would like to know if it's true that a certain coalition of male lions has come through and killed over a hundred lions in the Sabi Sands, and that's specifically the Birmingham Coalition of Lions. And M. Dakota, I think that is highly, highly unlikely for a coalition of five males to kill a hundred lions in total would be kind of devastating for the entire population of the Sabi Sands. Um, possibly another coalition, but even then, I, I just think a hundred lion is just too many to kill, and there's probably only a hundred lion in the entire Sabi Sands, so it would have left them with no mates and no future, really, just the five of them running around together. So even other coalitions I don't think would have killed that many. Um, again, it's important to distinguish between, I think, an adult lion and a, and a lion cub uh, in this uh, in this event, um, although they all count. Um, Obviously, adult lions uh, are, in a, in a, you can count as an entirety as, as a lion because they've made it through, whereas lion cubs, and that's why we don't name lion cubs until they are at least a kind of, or we don't name any animals really, but you don't really start to familiarize yourself or get too attached to them before they're a year of age because any point up till then, 
is a very slippery slope for them or a dangerous time of their life. Maybe 20 lions, maybe 25 lions, but 100 is a very, very large figure. Interesting, I'm not sure where you heard that from, but it would be interesting to know that because then we could obviously try and somehow converse with that person. PK in Iowa. You are wondering, because of the Birmingham Coalition's inexperience with mating and having cubs with lioness, that there could be a possibility that they may kill their first offspring just because they're confused and they don't actually know that they're theirs. I guess there is a slim chance that that would happen, but I'm inclined to think otherwise. Um, even though bizarre things do happen, aren't you? Like I said, anything is possible. I don't think that is going to be the case. and. I haven't really heard of any cases like that happening in the past, so that's what's leaning me towards them not doing that. On the topic of male lions, a couple of you said that Junior, the young male that used to move with this pride, who was born to this pride, was seen on a road in the Kruger National Park called the H12. We've tried to work out where exactly in the Kruger Park the H12 is and we haven't been able to pinpoint that, and we would like to know where that is because it would be interesting, firstly, to know how far away it is from here. Gerda uh, and MK in Houston, you guys are the, the ones that said that you had, had seen him, and I would just like to know how on earth do you know that it's him and just not another young male lion that looks like him. Um, so maybe there was very, very telltale marks or a scar that, that you know, if you can confirm 120% that it was him, it'll be a fascinating fact. Um, but I'm just concerned as to how you, you, you can be certain that it was him. There's so many young male lions moving through the Kruger National Park that all, to me, look very similar. Um, so let us know more about that. And also, please, if possible, can you let us know where the age 12 is? Um, and then we can all get involved and debate the reality of it, in fact, being him. He hasn't been seen in the Sabi Sands, as far as we're aware, for quite some time now. Um, so it would be nice to try and get to the bottom of that. We're going to send you back to Jamie quickly. She would like to say goodbye to you, and we're going to be waiting here with the lion for your return. And we thought we'd leave you with the stunning view of the full moon as we start to go into a very promising night drive. So join us again in an hour. Once we've got time to set everything up, I'm going to race back to camp and get the Mahindra and go and sit with those lions. But another extraordinary evening. A big thank you to Dave for all of his fantastic camera work, as well as to the lovely ladies in final control. And for all of you to your, for your questions and comments, I hope you have a wonderful day and that you will be joining us for our evening drive a little bit later. I'm going to say farewell for now and I'll catch up with you tomorrow for the Sunset Safari. Cheers, guys. Well, I'm happy to see that these lions are starting to slowly wake up again. Oh, there's Amber Ice, at least you can say goodbye to them while they are, in fact, awake. But it's only a temporary goodbye, hopefully, because, like we've said earlier, Brent and James are going to be coming out to see what they can find under the cover of darkness. It's always exciting being out a little bit later. And who knows, maybe some chameleons, maybe some scorpions. It's easier to see snakes at night in the trees as it is to see chameleons. So anything is possible. Of course, these ladies could be on the prowl. They could be hunting and on the move. So great, great prospects. Make sure to tune in in one hour's time when things kick off again. Big thanks, though, for following us on this regular Sunset Safari. It's been great to have you along. Thanks, Brian, Thanks, on God. camera. And thanks to Nikki and Kirsty in the final control room. It's been great fun. We'll see you next time.